Metallica, here they come, the kings of metal! What? Paul. Paul. Guys, I'm right here, and you're listening to Metal Up Your Podcast. Welcome to Metal Up Your Podcast. I'm Ethan Luck. And I'm Clint Wells. And Paul Moak. Paul Moak is here. With pa- here. Well, you know what? Hey, let's, uh, let's give it up for Paul. Hold on. Let's we're going to put this down. Let's give it up for Paul Moak. Paul He's clapping for himself. Awesome. Thank He's you so much for help. being here, Paul. <laughs> Paul Moak is here, and uh, this is episode 111, and we're going to attempt and succeed this time to listen through the Black Album with our commentary, and of course, the addition of Paul Moak, get his studio insights, his producer insights, uh, and thoughts on the record. I can't wait. If you guys remember, Paul did our Bob Rock episode. If, if I'm right, Paul, Black Album's your favorite Metallica record. Yeah. So after our initial one got lost in the cosmos somewhere, we thought, well, if we're going to... I remember after the episode got lost, I remember telling you, I don't think I can do that again. <laughs> I can't do that anytime again. Anytime soon. <laughs> like, Gotta wait, wait we a few We went months. so deep. So the, <laughs> having Paul here is going to make a fresh turn. And we have here, the YouTubers, let's wave to the YouTubers. What up? We have Black and Whiskey. Black and Whiskey, listen. Uh, black and Whiskey. Black and Whiskey. Black and Whiskey. Sorry. Black and Whiskey. Black and Whiskey. Now, we haven't tried this yet. I've nope. never had any of this. We just poured it. I've never we had it. We just poured it. And we're going to do a toast here at the top of the episode, get the vibes centered and right. What are you toasting to, Ethan? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and toast to uh, the, the man who helped create this, and they partnered with Dave Pickerel. Rest in peace. Rest in peace. All right. That's my toast. Paul? I'm going to toast the awesome week we just had. Nice. Very good. The Metal Up Party. Yeah. The Amazing show, show in yeah. Nashville. Sitting in front of the the... I'm all caught in my cable. Sitting in front of the Black Album road cases. Yeah, we're gonna. So we're gonna do a brief Must recap have been of nice. some okay. of that, guys. Yes. <laughs> the um, photo looked great. And know, then three's a crowd, dude. That's yeah, true. We that's loved true. it. We yeah. had actually a really touching conversation about friendship and about that's art cool. and life yeah. that I don't wow. think would have been possible had you been there. Wow. Okay, that's great. I'm, well, I'm happy for you guys. Good for you. Good for just you. Just kidding. And to prove you, I'm just kidding. My toast will be to friendship. There you go. To friendship. So Bring it right in the middle. Sip. All right. All right. What if it's terrible? Yeah, Here we go. Whew. Smooth. It is smooth. I guess. I don't really know how to talk about whiskey. Yeah. I can tell you that I, I really like it. I can tell you that I'm going to continue drinking it until yeah, this Yeah, I'm not going to stop. Yeah, now, it doesn't have that aftertaste oh, of like Jack Daniels. We were like, like, oh, God. It doesn't really, it doesn't like burn going down, which I like. It's very smooth. Even though I make country music professionally, and I'm in some ways, uh, by proxy of that, a professional drinker. To this day, if I do a shot of Jack, I almost throw up. Really? I, it's like so I've sort of perfected the thousand yard stare where you can't tell that's happening, but yeah. I almost throw up internally. Time. It's yeah, that's how I'm with Jaeger. It's just a complete gag reflex. I can't remember who it was. It might have been our, uh, Jeff Fireball at the party. It was like someone mentioned something about Jaeger and wanted to get me a shot. I was like, "Bro, you give me that shot, I'm going to pour it on the ground. Yeah, I will not drink that crap. That's a shame. I drank your. Someone brought you a Jameson. Sh- no. No, I would have drank that. There was a Jameson shot. <laughs> that might have been mine because Jameson is yeah. a trigger for me. Uh, I typically like rye whiskeys more yeah. than corn. This it seems like a corn based corn with a K. There is yeah. high fructose corn yeah. syrup in here yeah. for sure. Did you guys see the Instagram of a guy with cornrows? Listening to corn while eating corn on the cob. <laughs> I have seen that before. Corn overload. Speaking He's of that, favorite. we need to we need to talk a little bit about Dude. corn. There was a corn moment because yes. some of the guys at Corn were at the show. So if you're joining us for the first time, somehow amazingly, here's the deal: we're an all Metallica podcast. Ethan and I, and of course our our guest host Paul Moak, we are all professional musicians in Nashville, Tennessee. We get together once a week to talk about our favorite metal band, Metallica. We're going to be talking about the Black Album, but first we got to recap some of the party. We got to recap some of the show. That's right. Now, do we want to knock out the housekeeping before we do that, or should we lead off a little bit of recap? Let's lead off some recap. Let's All change right. it up a little bit. Now, you've heard our episodes on the party and the show. I that have. was just Ethan and I. Paul is, <laughs> Paul's heard it. 
And uh, but I think some of us want to hear what your perspective was. Yeah. Uh, man, the party was amazing. You know, we were waiting for you to get there to even start it. I know, you sent me a text. Was, yeah. No pressure. Yeah. And meanwhile, I'm like trying to put my kids down, knowing that it's just ten minutes away, and they're probably already started, so it's fine. And then I get this text that's like, "By the way, we're not starting till you get here." I was like, <laughs> "I mean, the party was rolling, but yeah. our, our our intro and all that stuff, we wanted to wait for you to get there." Did you see my response? You were like, go ahead and do it without me. I said, something. go ahead and do the email corner without oh, me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do the housekeeping. We're gonna, what if we read emails from stage <laughs> yeah. right now? That would be really fun and exciting. We're only going to read five. Everyone just sit tight. Everyone chill. Check Everyone this out. Everyone be quiet. This one's from uh, so-and-so. He's in the room tonight. But it kind of worked out. Man, you got there right in time. I did. And it was fantastic. The whole night was amazing. I think that for me, the the community, I know that this is a theme that's been talked about a million times, but the 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 friendships that have naturally happened because of your guys' show. And I even tried to say this at the end of the night that you two did this because I was there at the table when you guys decided to do this podcast. And it was because you both love this band so much. And then what it's become has, it's so far from just a show about a band that we love, you know, it's a whole Mm -hmm. community now of people (laughs) <laughs> like I did I was it my first time meeting Sarah at the party? I think I, it was. I, well, yeah, because she wasn't at the first party. Uh, no, I, we we first met her all together in Detroit. Oh, she that's right. That's she right. came up okay. and in, introduced herself at that show. At well, the, no at wonder the bar. I was like this feels like a long lost friend, right? Yeah. You know. And but she has that vibe anyway. I've got a good but picture the, of you and her from the show by the way that I need to send you. Please. There there's just so many like family members in this thing mm-hmm. now it's pretty and, cool and yeah. so i came tonight with one agenda besides talking about the black elves. okay <laughs> two agendas uh i'm just gonna speak it into existence here on the microphone i think that the year three party should be in europe before metallica stadium show next year the fans are they of still this gonna show, be yeah when are the, what's the tour? Next I don't, January? Well, they're doing the stadium tour again, but... Yeah? I don't know when it is. Is it over by then? It, I think it's this summer. I don't know. I'm, I think it's the summer, because Wes is going over there. Dang it. pretty A European time. party would be pretty fun. They've got one more run okay. in the U.S. So forget the, the year three thing. <laughs> year 2.5. Before 5. this is over, I just think that you two should do a show from the pre-party before a European... Stadium. I mean, that, that would be cool, and could, I think the listeners of this podcast can help that happen. We'll we whether it's a year party or not, we could maybe go over there for a show or two and do a party over there. Absolutely. That would be crazy. I love that. That's your agenda. I, 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 I you know why that it's working because I literally has not occurred to me, and now I'm I'm seeing it. Even. Yeah. Right, right. Well, what? But he's a producer. That's a total producer. He produces. Well, but things. here's here's <laughs> producing why, ideas right now. Here's why this even came into my mind was. That night was so special before the show, and it was like, you kept saying, next year won't be like this because there's no Metallica show the next day. True. And that got me thinking, well, why don't we just go where more Metallica shows are? Why wait for the band to come to you? Why not go to them? Exactly. We can just go to Vail, Colorado and camp out in front of James's house. Yeah, we'll do an episode in front of James's house. Even so, I think there's there's a lot of merit in terms of the podcast and what people want to hear and and of you guys going over there and the whole experience. I mean, that's like... I'm in. I've, I'm, I'm going to buy my plane ticket tomorrow. There you go. I just bought mine. <laughs> yeah? Oh, yeah. I've got this new, th- new Travelocity. Chip, in, chip in my head. That I, can a- <laughs> I can access Expedia real quick. Well, so I know that a lot of people had a fun time meeting you, and it almost seemed like... We talked about it in our recap. Not that we're fucking Metallica or anything, but there was it was structured in a way where there was like an area where people could come say hello. Yeah. If they wanted to get a picture, yeah. if they wanted to buy merch or whatever. Meet and greet style. Totally. And there was you know, there was quite a long line for that. Just hey look, I'm just telling it like it is, guys. Paul can corroborate he yeah. was there. Yeah. But I felt like a lot of people there wanted to meet you know, you have your own sort of cult cult personality with the show. You said it best. You said you're famous for not being here. Right. It's right, yeah. There was people asking about Paul before he got there. Like where's Paul? Is he coming? <laughs> yeah. Uh, this he's is a, part he's of the stick. Well, it wasn't part of the stick. That people were genuinely <laughs> excited to see you. Man, it was. It, it, it honestly really warmed my heart. I told my wife the next day, who's not a Metallica. What fan, must she though. think about? What does like, she think about? Tell that the people love me. Uh, she she's not a Metallica fan, but she understands the culture. She gets it. But what does she think about the fact that people wear shirts that have your name on them? <laughs> I think she thinks it's a little strange. <laughs> 
when I showed her the picture that you took of right. me pointing yeah. up and the guy with Paul, she yeah. was like, how did he even spot that? I was like, I have no, no idea. Not only was Cl- that one of my... Clint spent both shows look, trying to look out, look out for shirts. He's like, found one up there. Yeah. I swear, I'm not going to say I don't do any of that. Like, I wasn't looking a little bit. But when I saw the Paul guy, I wasn't looking. I oh, did, you just happened to I, glance yeah. up or something? At all three shows that I went to that week, there were several moments, usually during Black Album songs, because they were getting the biggest response, where I just wanted to take in the crowd. Yeah. Sure. So it wasn't super selfishly motivated. Like, who's wearing my show? Who likes my podcast? Right. And you like people <laughs> watching, too. Well, it's <laughs> like, I've, I've been watching James for like 30 minutes straight. Maybe yeah. let me like just see what's going on. And I happened to see the Paul guy. Top five moment of that week, of my Metallica week, probably top 10 moment of my life. <laughs> Is, Top 10 moment of your life. Seeing a guy at the Metallica show, you, he's a big fan. You know he's got lots of Metallica shirts. You know he's got lots of other hardcore metal shirts. And what yeah. did he choose he to wear? He wore that shirt. And not only that, when I'm, I'm looking past Paul at, to see it. Yeah. It's and un- he's, unreal. He's not someone close to us. He didn't tell us he was wearing it. We didn't organize it beforehand. That's what. That's one of the consequences of this fucking. He podcast. clearly yeah. listens to the podcast if he has that shirt because the only or he follows us on social media. Because that's the only way to. Well, no. When I when it. I posted on Instagram, he found me. He did. Okay, he was cool. like that. I think that was me. Oh, oh that's, that's awesome. awesome. Yeah. What a guy. What yeah. a what a minch. That's so awesome. Um, any any good takeaways from the party? I mean, you know, you already kind of mentioned like the, the aspect of the Metallica family and how cool that was, uh, or any 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 other highlights that you would like to point out. I mean, I just want to tell you guys what a great job you've done i mean the the growth in this show especially interacting with the fans of metallica and of metal up your podcast the the growth between year one and year two on the parties was insane and not just in terms of number of people but like the engagement and how how much everybody knows each other and the level of inside inside jokes and everything was just like no. Let me ask incredible. you a, a pretty serious question about the party. Yeah, did you witness the burrito incident? <laughs> no, were you present for that? <laughs> no, we. Uh, if it's okay to talk about on air, <laughs> we talked about God for about thirty seconds, and then <laughs> I turned around to walk out, and I think that's when you bent over to to pick up the burrito. Okay, it, it, it was. I think just. I mean, like a minute after yeah. you left. Yeah. Well, it was earlier in the night when Paul was like, "I got to go get a burrito, dude. I've been eating really healthy." But I was like, "And it was good." I was like, "They have burritos here." Yeah. yeah. So you just—it's just setting the scene for that because that was maybe two hours before previously laying the groundwork. No, I—you didn't eat mine because I ate all of it. The, but here's the thing, because people will find this funny. The guy that—do you remember the guy that won his name? It was like Miguel or something. Uh, the guy, the guy that turned forty. Yeah. I forgot his name. I'm, and starts, I'm, he so, wasn't, I'm so sorry. He wasn't even from the U.S., right? He's from Colombia. That's right. And uh, He's like, damn it, customs. I can't bring yeah. this back home. Yeah. <laughs> so he wins the grand prize, the black in 80... That batch 80, 81. 81, 81 yeah. And a bunch of other stuff. Mm-hmm. And he, he gets on stage, and I go to give him a hug, and as we're hugging, he says, I'm turning 40 in four minutes. And we had this amazing moment where it was like, Holy cow, dude. You won the whole prize. You're here. We're getting to see Metallica tomorrow. You're turning 40. It's all coming together. And I turn to Clint and I go, how can you not believe in God at this moment? (laughs) And Clint goes, dude, I believe. And then he turned around. And that's when I walked off and I think that you started eating the burrito. You didn't hear the rest of my sentence was, I believe I'm going to eat this burrito here. (laughs) (laughs) I believe I'm going to eat this burrito on the ground. Uh, And I'm pretty sure it belongs to Met Club, uh, Mike. I love it, dude. (laughs) Well, it was such a treat to have you there, and you were at Party 1, too, and hopefully if maybe if we rock it in Europe, you can come, too, if we can convince all of our families to do that. We, yeah, we, when, it, <clears throat> when it gets closer, we got a little bit of time. Yeah, yeah. When we get to year three here in Nashville, it'd be fun to do something extra, like maybe a live, live band or right. something like that. We can jump on stage and rock out a little bit. It will be interesting to see, and I'm sure you guys have already talked about it, but what, what will happen to the podcast if the band goes dark after touring this cycle? I think maybe maybe we go dark. Oh, we go dark. Hey, well, listen, we're following the band, man. Yeah. <laughs> if they go dark, we go dark. That's when we, that's when we take a trip to Vail. <laughs> <laughs> well, the opposite is how cool it is to be in this moment when everything is happening. Right. Yeah. And, and I to totally be along agree. For the ride. And, and I think that like people ask us all the time, are we going to meet the boys and all that? And it's going to happen. I think I think I think things are going to maybe back to a little bit of the God stuff. I think things are going to crescendo together. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think you've, you've witnessed to them, dude. 
What if the whole reason for this podcast is Clint <laughs> finding get, God finding again God. Metallica? <laughs> the very last episode yeah. is him accepting Jesus into his heart. Oh my goodness. Nothing would make me happier. This is, this uh, is a fun teleplay yeah. we're reacting out. So I can clean, see Quinn's we, ears steaming right now. <laughs> the, the evil coming out. It's all in love. The big pentagram tattoo I have on my entire upper torso is burning it's right now. It's got hot, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> so we were invited, and obviously you couldn't make it. We, we right. talked about you were rehearsing with Need to Breathe, but yep. we were invited graciously by our friend Wes, which again, thank you so much to Wes, mm-hmm. to yeah, go Wes. take a backstage tour of the show. So Paul and I, Met at three at Bridgestone. We got in, and I, I don't know about you, Paul, but I thought it was just going to be tuning room because that's kind of Wes's purview, and it ended up being really a tour of the entire thing. Yeah, everything. I had no idea. What do you think when we were so we we were walking to the stage? The first thing we saw was the tuning room. We can talk about that, but when we were leaving that, I thought maybe we were being led back out or something, and that's when we passed through like the binge and purge cases, and we both got a picture. It's the only picture we took. Yep. But then as we're walking, we just started walking the arena and then we started walking through the like the barricade to the stage. I, I didn't, I was like amazed. I was playing it cool, but I was like, like oh, here we and go. And then all the techs were at their stations like, well, we're going to meet everybody. Yeah. That was unbelievable, dude. That's so cool. It was crazy to me that, well, first of all, I was nervous at the onset because I was walking up to find you mm-hmm. and the security lady in the, in the like outside the arena it was like, you can't take that chain wallet in. And I was like, I, I, it's just my wallet. She's like, no chains. And I was like, <laughs> and I got dropped off by Uber. So I was like, I don't know what to do. So I like kind of hid it in my pocket. And then we tried to go in with Wes. And mm-hmm. the lady was like, you can't go in here. That's true. We had some trouble. With the total Friday. power trip. Yeah. There's always one of those at an arena. And I, tour. So immediately I was like, it's because of my chain. Oh, that's what it is. <laughs> But some chain discrimination, man. We just went to a different, and you know, he's got an all access pass working with Metallica, and she's like, "Nope, can't let him in." He's like, rolling so his she eyes. She was hardcore, dude. But yeah. he he was really respectful, though. Yeah, he was like, now, "I Wes get is it." A pro, they're they're yeah. doing their job. So he just was like, basically, go down to the next exit. So we did. Yeah, and literally, the girl looked at us and was like, "Didn't even." Well, hey, I, I, well, I did my nice own. I did my own. Yeah. I did my own pro yeah. move. Right when we walked in, I saw she was reading the book. That's right. First thing I did, what you reading? There you go. Just imme- and I'm not saying I used her. Like I really was interested. Like, but took an interest in what she was it up helps. to. She starts telling me, "Oh, this book is by the. You ever read this? It's amazing. You should really check it out." The whole time we're showing her our thing. We're kind of moving towards the elevators. Yeah. Before she knows it, she's still. She was still telling. Literally, the doors of the elevator are closing. She's like, "I really think you should read the book." Yeah. Ch- check it out. <laughs> you remember, do you remember <laughs> that? Barnes and Noble. You, you were like, "Thank you, bye bye bye." I hate goodbyes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So here, here's my takeaway from it. It was it an is, Anne Rice novel, right? <laughs> it was some young adult shit that, yeah. I, that I'd never heard of. Some bu- uh, buff dude on the cover. When, when we walked me. in... Yeah, me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. No, you're good. Us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I wonder if there's a good... Sorry, Paul. There's a good graphic designer out there that could make a romance novel of me and Clint. And that, could, <laughs> that could be our next t-shirt. The question is, who's the fo- who's the the hard nippled, uh, the muscled Fabio, and who's the damsel in his right. arms? I'm cool with either <laughs> role, man. We'll, we'll flip a coin. It's cool. Okay. We'll let fate. I'll decide. accept any any role if I can be a part of a a romantic novel cover. Back to is, Paul's takeaway. Anyways, Wait, Paul. is the bad guy ever like lurking in the corner? Could that, that could be, be you. Me? Yeah. yeah, maybe yeah. that's you. Dreadlock man. Yeah. Okay. Kind of looks like the predator. <laughs> Awesome. The Predator did have dreadlocks, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah, he was Rasta. When I ride my bike, I get called the Predator a lot. <laughs> People shout that? Oh, yeah. In Nashville? Well, just my friends are like, I saw you driving down 12 South. You look like the Predator. Anytime I'm near, I've seen you on 12 South running a lot. Oh, yeah. In, when I'm in my car. Yeah. Well, I've just, never shouted Predator. Though. I just start driving down 12 South in the morning. I'm always there running or riding. I mean, <clears throat> sex Predator, maybe, but not, <laughs> not like from the 80s Predator, not the alien. <laughs> All right, so we walk in, and here's my one takeaway. I, The three of us have been on a lot of big, you know, we've done our share of touring. And yes. so in my mind, I kept telling myself as I was walking in, like, don't miss stuff just because you're used to seeing it. Mm. Like, we saw their washer and dryer in a road case. <laughs> that was pretty interesting. They travel the washer, washer yeah. and dryer. That's cool. It's probably for their assistance to wash all their shit. That's awesome. Honestly, the washer and dryer looked like it was binge and purge era. <laughs> it, it looked, Old school. It looked yeah, pretty yeah. beat up, yeah. But, like, the normal touring 
you know, me would would have walked in and just been like, oh, but I was like, this is Metallica's washer. That's and dryer. Lars's favorite yeah, yeah. Kenmore. <laughs> yeah. But everything like that, like just the detail on the layout and logistically, like how they set up the arena and like the backstage area, it is very normal to any kind of touring experience. Mm-hmm, yeah. But with a hint of Metallica in every yeah, true. aspect of That's it. That's cool. That was so cool, man. Man. And when we walked in the tuning room, A, it was a lot like it was a lot more low low tech and mm-hmm. smaller than I thought it was gonna be. Mm-hmm. Like it's pretty no frills. Yeah, it's pretty bare bones and just they're there to work. Yeah. yeah. It's and cool. That was inspiring to me. And equally inspiring was like how much the guys like one of those guys never even stopped playing like his Nintendo Switch <laughs> yeah. to even look up at us. Cisco. He was like, "How I much?" Mean, he's he was, just unimpressed with the whole thing. Oh yeah, it was just he's like, like "Why would you wanna, even want to see this stuff?" Just want to play know? Mario Kart. He was I, nice to us. It, he was, was super nice and pro, but I felt embarrassed to be as excited as I was right. in front of him. Right. I get it though. Like I mean, like when I was working for Kings, there was times where like uh, a local hand who was working the show that happened to be a fan would walk over to where me and Nacho would stand and look inside and be like, hey, is that that guitar that Caleb plays in there? I'm like, yeah, it's just right there. And I'd, I'd pick it up and show it to him. He's like, and to me, it's like I saw that guitar every day, so it becomes right. less cool, you mm-hmm. know? It's like growing up by Disneyland. After a while, you're like, it's just there. Yeah. I don't care anymore. That's kind of the vibe that they all had and totally understood. Yeah. Yeah, they they're, they deal with that gear every day, so it's not new and exciting to them. They answered any question we had. I mean, we were we were grilling them, especially when we got to the yeah. LD. We were asking the LD a lot of questions. So like, what game, <laughs> what game are you playing on the Switch? <laughs> to me, Zelda? though, a lot of Mario the, Kart? some of the stuff that literally saw in the documentary, like, in life, in front of me, you know, was just like, so surreal. Because I've studied that thing, like, you know, I have the same opinions as you guys about St. Anger, but I've like paused certain parts of that doc just to look at like different gear that they use in the studio. Just to make sure it's Oshkosh Bakash, yeah. the overalls that he's yeah. wearing yeah. when he slams the yeah. door. To make sure that the door really is hollow core. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the door that won't slam. <laughs> but no, like picture of the console and yeah. stuff like that. And and when we were passing, what's the ba- uh, base text name? Zach. Yeah. Who's in the movie? Like, yeah. He's well, been we there have since over, Cliff. We yeah. have over two hundred and fifty. That was that guy. Know, yeah. Guitars. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, with Jason, Jason. The rest took are all, in storage. What did he say? He's like Jason took all his bases. Yeah, Jason, yeah. Jason took all his bases when he left, but they still had a bunch of bases. I just thought of that. That was Robert's first time meeting that guy, and that's yeah. his base tech now. Yeah, yeah. And and we were standing right in wow. front of him, wow. and he was talking about restringing a bass and fixing a grounding issue. Mm-hmm. Or, you know. Yep. It was just, man. You saw me make a fool out of myself in front of Chad a little bit, and I was like, "You didn't make a fool." I was like, "Is that a '58 or a '59?" He was like, "No, it actually, it's a re- it's a 2004 reissue." I'm like, <laughs> oh, "Okay, cool." Uh, I, I play guitar dude, professionally. That, the V, the those... V was there. That Ken Lawrence was there. Oh, the the. Um, Do you know how much those Vs go for? Which one, the e- ESP one or no, no, the, no, um, the the electric original Karina? Uh, that's not an original. That, that's a that's a replica. Oh, okay. He had some kind of weird knockoff. That made by a, a company called Electra. Yeah. That, oh wow. That was the, the so the original Electra they still have and it's been restored. I think it's at, it's at HQ. Um, but the one he plays on tour. What is that? An ESP? Uh, I, I wonder. If We've he, done a whole episode on that. I know. I know. I can't remember if ESP made it for him because it, it has a Gibson logo on it, like he, the Electra did. He did have a '59 Carina Explorer in there. You said that maybe was a that's 59, what right? 58 or '59. Yeah, Wes told me that. Yeah. What are those? What do those go for? Two fifty. Two hundred fifty dollars isn't that's not yeah. that that's bad. Not, <laughs> a Carina, a Carina Explorer, and a V from from fifty eight and fifty nine. For those listening, they're court. not sure what the Carina Explorer is. It's the one that's like the wood grain with the black yes. pick guard. It's what he's been playing on Bell's this tour. Yeah, because yeah. that it's Carina wood from Africa. It was like a super difficult wood for Gibson to work with, so they only used it for a couple of years, and then they were like, "This is stupid." I, I, yeah. I guarantee we have the same image. Who's the guitar player you associate that guitar with, though? More than anyone. Karina Explore? Yeah. The Edge. The Edge. Yeah. The That's edge. the I Will Follow. Yeah, yeah. That's like the sound of U2's like first three records was a Karina Explore, a Memory Man, and a Vox AC3. Yeah. Absolutely. You know? And so it's it's cool to see James being like, gonna, gonna, go. Yeah. yeah. Edge, 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 <laughs> edge. He's got a Memory Man. <laughs> They're yeah. playing bells. 
shake a dee. He actually just goes deck a dee, deck a dee one time, and then yeah. the rest of it's yeah, just, just the, looped. The, the, yeah. Where the streets have no names, right? Echo effect. Mm. Um, okay, how about moving on into the show? Any takeaways from the show itself? I mean, it was incredible. The uh, I told you guys this, but uh, seeing the stadium show, you mm. know, it's basically the arena version of the same, you know, block yeah. of touring or whatever. I know mm-hmm. they took a break, but uh, one, I felt like translated better as a production and performance on the stadium. The song one? Yes. Yeah. Every, yeah. Everything else, I felt like in the round, in the arena, killed the stadium. Yeah, I well, agree. Well, on one, I mean, they uh, with those giant Megatron things, they had all that cool artwork of the soldiers walking across. Yeah, when they, they start to... Go, Gaga, da 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 da, and it's like yeah. the the death march, and then yeah. one of them is uh, there's like a puss head one yeah, that yeah. goes by. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, and then also obviously the it, whole intro with all the pyro on the stadium tour was just killer. Yeah. And they had the dancing flame on moth. There were some things yeah. about the stadium, but I don't know, th- man. One was really the only song that I felt like, and and maybe. Uh, no, I think one was really the. What only about song. like sad or unforgiven or dude? has to be arena because that's what the memory that I've lived with since right. I was a child. Right. Yeah. And yeah. being in the round, like Metallica was made to play that way. Yeah. It, it really, it fit, it suits them well, man. Yeah. It does. It's, it's so cool. And it's, and it, to me, it's another way that they're such a fan friendly band. They're trying to do whatever they can to give everyone a better seat in the house. If they were on one end of the arena, the people way back in the nosebleeds, they'd still enjoy it and have fun. But for them to be right in the middle of it, it's it's all about fan interaction. Yeah. James and the guys are going to different microphones the whole show. And you, He's you know, given everyone different amounts of time. It's great. You know what's crazy? When we did the walk around, the stage is really small. Yeah, it's pretty small. It looks big when you're watching the show. Like it, but, if you if you compare it to the Death Magnetic stage, the yeah. Death Magnetic stage was way more of a rectangle. Yeah. And they they must have sold less tickets. Like yeah. not I'm not saying they re- reverse engineered that, but there's not enough room for people. Right. Yeah. This stage is almost like Taylor, like we want to sell more. We're going to be able to sell more tickets. It just seemed yeah. like it was more about the, the, intimacy. the crowd. And yeah. The, yeah. That's true. Yeah. What was your favorite moment of the show or a couple other than seeing a guy wearing a Paul shirt? I mean, we, we, uh, we, we, we all know that's number one. <laughs> dude, I, this honestly, I've showed 18 different people this and I'll Can you see name how them fast. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Devin, what are all the okay. social security Devin, Here it is. Talitha. So before, okay, I was wondering how the Jim Brewer thing would work out. Mm-hmm. And dude, the way that, I don't know how he did it, but him and who's the other comedian that was doing Joe this? Sib. Joe yeah, Sib. Yeah, yeah. So Jim Brewer would come out, make fun of a bunch of people in whatever section he was in. Then he would dip back in and they would play music. Mm-hmm. Joe Sib would play music and... Over by Big Mick. Yeah, and a lot of it was just like classic rock tunes. Some of it was mashed up. Kind of DJ-ish, but not like EDM. And so Jim Brewer would dip out and then show up somewhere else in the arena. And I don't know if you guys noticed this, but the temperature of the audience and like the excitement for Metallica kept growing yeah. from the time we walked in hmm. to where before they played... uh What's the ACDC song with the bagpipes? Long Way to Tie. Yeah, yeah. Right before that was this. And I couldn't believe it, dude. This is 18,000 people. No one on the stage. All the house lights up. And no one saying anything, just music playing. And listen to this. It's them all singing it. Every single yeah. person, yeah. dude. I mean that's I mean that's why they have Jim Brewer doing this. Like they they probably thought oh, this will be fun. It'll be different than having an opening band. But I mean we've said it on numerous episodes. He he he's a comedian and a hype man for this. Well, yeah, Dude, total yeah. hype man. And because people have said it's like oh he's it's not like traditional comedy. It's like yeah it really isn't. It's actually more like a wrestling event. It kind of is. Yeah, and, and he's catering a lot of his jokes to the band. And, yeah, and, you know, and, and on that subject and and it's. I just I, think I love he took it. he took eighteen thousand people that were excited to see Metallica and made them feel like. We're in the midst of something that's really special. I don't. I totally agree. Like, had he was he, had he been able to come to the party, you know, I had this whole thing prepared. I just wanted to be like, dude, on behalf of like all of us, you are fucking kicking ass out yeah. there. Yeah, he really is. 
Think about how hard it must be to get up in front of 18,000 metalheads yeah. who are psyched to see Metallica yeah. and you've got to tell a few jokes. The good Honestly, thing for him, I think, is that he is a metalhead. He loves Metallica. He's one of us. He so. can relate to everybody yeah. in the crowd, you know? So he can get up there and make, you know, everything from, you know, just talking about old thrash stuff and getting people excited to, like, you know, pointing out people in the crowd that are too old to mosh now or, or how old the band looks. Like, if you haven't seen the band since the 90s, yeah. they look a little different. Right. You know, all that kind of stuff. People think it's hilarious. And so before the band comes out, they make those barricades, and you were kind of on the rail of the barricade yeah, yeah. with Sarah, right? Yeah, and Sa- Sarah was so sweet. She was like telling me where to stand, and like, she knows she's yeah. done it a few times. There was another fan that was like, she, kinda, "Don't smile like that, Paul. Don't smile like <laughs> yeah. that." There was another <laughs> close fan. Close your mouth. There was another fan that kind of, I think, drank a little too much before then, and she knew exactly. He's like, he he always gets like this. Oh, she's yeah. like, I just have to kind of work my way around and she, she was like talking about me drill. it was yeah. me it was, it was Clint. Clint, yeah. he does this podcast oh i yeah. forgot you know it so i just wanted to tell the story of like so we were back by big mick they make the barricade because the band comes through this tunnel right by us and that's when they started to let the vip guys come out yep. we saw aziz and everyone was trying to get him on their phone or whatever uh one of the big and rich guys we saw yep. some real cool looking guy looked like kings of leon guy but i don't think it was kings of leon and then that the, was me. And then the corn guys come. Yep. And there's one of the corn guys, monkey or something, has it dreads. Was Brian, Brian had Brian Welch. Welch. Which, and were people yelling at you about what were they yelling at so, you? So, uh, it's you know we look similar. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. We both have sleeves, the yeah, dreadlocks. tattoos, the dreadlocks. Um, I don't wear eye makeup, but he does. Was he wearing eye makeup? I, they might. I it might be tattooed does. on. Oh shit! But or, uh, huge mistake. But you know we're like four feet four feet from each yeah. other, so all these fans are like yelling because we're right at the base of where the bowl starts. Did he acknowledge you? We he kind of looked at me and was like, <laughs> "Brother, <laughs> yeah, like hey man." <clears throat> I wonder if Brian Headwelch was like, "Hey man, are you in corn? Yeah, are, are you me?" <laughs> are you but it was funny. M- everybody monkey? everybody had that reaction, like all the the fans that were right above us at the bottom of the bowl yeah. we're like looking down they're like corn and then they would point at me and then they'd point back at him <laughs> and everybody looked confused like it was maybe that's the drummer yeah yeah and he just kind of like looked at me like this i was like hmm. hmm and then uh i think it was sarah leaned over and goes your dreads are much better <laughs> <laughs> you know his dreads are a little too perfect i yeah. think uh, i didn't get a good look at him Oh, I did. He's a really oh, nice I did, guy. Did you? I've actually I, I stared met him, him before. He's really sweet. Yeah, he's yeah. a nice dude. I've, I've, long I've heard all those dudes are super cool. Yeah. yeah. But man, there there was a bunch of I was I was really excited to see a bunch of Nashville kind of fringe celebrities that were literally freaking out as much as we were. Yeah. To see corn. I yeah. mean to see corn. To see see corn. Metallica. Yeah. Well, I saw corn. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, it was cool to look over and see, like, you know, like Big Kenny from Big and Rich over there. You know, it's like, you kind of want to roll your eyes, but I'm like... He didn't have to come out, He's dude. here to watch the show. Yeah. yeah. Like, he's not here to, like, be seen, because no one gives a shit who he is at a Metallica show. Yeah. Right. None of those fans care about Big and Rich. Right. So he's there, like, I'm I'm seeing Metallica. And maybe he's buddies with James. I mean, you never know. Yeah. yeah. You know I, what else? This is super nerdy, but uh, the a bunch of guys from Claire Brothers... The audio company that does a lot of touring. Yeah. Oh yeah. We're yeah. back. We're back by the ca- console. And oh. it was dudes that have run front of house or monitors for other tours that I've been on, and they all wanted to come see Big Mick. Oh, front of house. nice. That's cool. Really cool. That's awesome. It's like pay respects, you know, yeah. almost. I I looked back there at him a few times. That was no joke. He was working. Oh, dude. He wasn't like it wasn't an automated show. I mean, no. he was. And you know what's my favorite is like they have him there where he has line of sight to the band. But he's never looking up. He's always down, yeah. just like mixing, yep. doing his job. And I think he has a few screens and stuff, but yeah, he's like yeah. pushing faders. And I mean, there's a lot of shit going on. When James, you, when you, you talked about on the recap too that um, that uh, there's cameras so they know where James is at each microphone. For monitors. At yeah. monitors, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Paul saw that with me. Yeah, that's cool. That was that was fascinating seeing Wes just show us how he slides through the teleprompter or the, yeah. the word wedge, as they yeah. like to call it. Yeah. It was cool, man. What an what an experience. I I will say, the stadium thing was amazing to be with that many people, but in the round is where the boys belong. Man. Yeah, it, I definitely was, think the arenas shows were better for me. Yeah, I mean, I, I I love my experience at the Philly and Detroit show with you guys. 
Um, but I, I, if I had the choice, I would take in the round arena shows any any day. Yeah, it just. I mean, brought really, up, I would take like the four hundred cap club down the street. That would be great too. But it just brought up every ounce of whatever I was feeling all throughout my childhood watching them on MTV. You know, mm-hmm. it's yeah. amazing. And Tabitha Soren. Yeah. And that's why. Oh, don't get him started on Tabitha the story. I follow her on Instagram. And Duff. We've had whole Remember text, Duffy? whole text threads that get derailed when we yeah. bring up some nineties and TV. That's true. Yeah, there's some good stuff. Back Who's there. the other? Not Kurt Loder, the other dude. That Kurt Loder. There was, there was Kennedy. Well, back in the day, it was um, Adam. He, not looked, Adam. he looked like Stephen Adler. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he did. Um, there's one that's a legitimate, real. I thought Kurt Loder was like a journalist. Kurt, Chris Conley. Chris Conley. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, he kind of looked like. Uh, um, I see him on like twenty twenty. Yeah, he would. Time. I think he, he kind of looked like John Cusack a little yeah. bit. Didn't he eventually take over like the MTV News thing? Yeah, for Kurt Loder. He Kurt Loder's one of my favorite. Kurt Loder's like yeah. ninety five now. By he, the way. Is he really? He's I, not that old. He's older than he, Ray Burton. He's older than Ray Burton by a year. Yeah. But by the way, happy birthday, Ray Burton. Just happy birthday, yeah, ninety four. Yeah, ninety five. Ninety eight. <laughs> Let's just keep. Was it ninety four? I think it's ninety three. Fact check. Who's going to fact check it? I'll do it. I'm not. You guys keep talking. If you're fucking wrong. If you're fucking wrong. In a world. In a world where we're both wrong. (laughs) Um, But yeah. I'm going to say he didn't have a birthday. (laughs) There we go. His birthday was in October. You guys can keep talking while I do this. Um, Um, What else was awesome? About the show? I'm with you guys. very happy 94th birthday to Mr. Ray There you go. You're reading your your own. Give me your whiskey. It's mine now. (laughs) Hey, I was wrong. You win. What was another thing you liked? Um, hi- um you you asked me highlights. Mm-hmm. Sabbath true. Yeah, dude, I think they play it slower than the rest. Yes, slower is better. We talked about it. It is better. Slower is heavier. You know what? Lars, Lars will speed up parts a lot, especially the thrash stuff. I feel yeah. like he hits like this cruising altitude speed and stays there. In you know that being faster than normal, but Sabat True, I yeah. kind of wish he would do that on Nothing Else Matters yeah. too. Yeah, well, like just lay. Back. He still has an in him. I think even the thrash stuff could be a little slower. Oh, it totally could. But but do you guys notice when when it goes da 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 da? He hits the string. It's an open note, but he hits it so hard it like detunes. It's out of tune a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ugh. I mean, uh, but that's also just like that passion when you're playing, man. You can't help right. but hit the fucking guitar hard, right? Low point for me. Okay. The Unforgiven. You had the same response to the stadium tour. They play it like literally twice as fast. Do they? It's like, how soon can we get this song what over I with? Feel? It is fast. What I've known, never shine, do what I... It's like... Yeah, there's not a lot of nuance in well, it. Well, yeah. that, that's where that's it, where I feel like it's 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 kind of Lars's duty to, to re- rein in a little bit, because James starts it. It misses that, like... True. The groove, you know, to quote Bob Rock in... The year and a half, he's like that. That Lars backbeat, right. that yeah. swagger, yeah. it doesn't have that. I think Lars gets honestly. I mean, maybe maybe back in the day when he sped up a lot, maybe it was the cocaine. Nowadays, I think he's just he he's like one of the he's having the best time up there. Yeah, I think he gets so excited. He do, he just doesn't even well think I'll, about timing. I'll say this too, and we all know this. Like in a normal situation, like in a town like Nashville, drummers even if the front man starts it at a wonky tempo. Drummer's job slowly reined it in. Yeah, I don't think they follow those kinds of traditional no, dynamics. I, I think he, I think Lars is following James. Yeah. So if James is playing or fast, or Lars is following Lars, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes he follows his own heart. That's right. Yeah. You have so, to, man. Well, sometimes you do. You really do into the heart of darkness. That's right. Hey, I'll take it twenty beats fast over not taking it at all. Though. I love seeing the Unforgiven. Some people, you know, yeah. people on the forums are like, I guess, because that was kind of a rotating slot, ballad slot. Mm-hmm. But after like the ninth show in a row, they're like, I guess it's a staple now. It's like, oh, there are worse songs. Oh, yeah. no. I'm just really disappointed for you guys because I texted both of you saying I would open mouth kiss you yeah. if they played the Unforgiven too. Yeah. And I'm really I was sad. hoping for Unforgiven too. <laughs> I'll be yeah. honest. We should have told the boys that somehow. I know. Well, well you guys were with Wes, Mister <laughs> VIP. Yeah, but we Drew. we didn't see the B bender out there, so we no, knew it wasn't we knew we happen. were able to see you all were the in guitars. the tuning room. You could have looked down if they had like some song titles written out there some and just suggestions. been like chicken and scratch, unforgiven to U F two exclamation point. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff we could have done that we didn't. Like we were so respectful. I could we have really reached were. up and grabbed one of James's picks. We could have done a lot. And of No weird one shit. would have. 
Sure. They left us in catering for well, an hour and a half. You by guys ourselves. are professionals. Yeah. It and, was and funny. Here's the thing. Wes basically knows you guys because of me and trusts me and then therefore trusts you. By extinction. By extinction. And but but you know, he knows that you guys are professionals and you've done done this for a living. Yeah. So he knows like it's like when we ended up in the in the family and friends room. I texted Wes, we were there, he's like he's like, just behave. You know the yeah. This is how respectful we were when they actually so we were able to sit in catering and have a cup of coffee. And just generally chill and talk. When they started to bring the food out, we were like, should we eat Like, eat the catering? And we were both like, nah. Yeah. Which technically with the working passes, you can't. We could have. Yeah. yeah. But we were like, let's just get the fuck out of here. See, I would have been chowing down. Really? And thank you God, because those chicken know. strips we had at Broadway Brewhouse <laughs> were to die for. You should have seen us trying to order over there. We were like, <laughs> we were like, we were like should we eat healthy? Yeah. Like, what should we do? Dude, it was amazing. Clint, Clint goes, uh, I, you know. Don't correct me on gotcha. the actual items that you were talking. He's <laughs> gotcha. like, "That's fine." How about the grilled chicken sandwich? She's just like, "Yeah, I don't know." You're like, and and Clint was like, "Thank you for your honesty." Um, <laughs> what about the salad? And she's like, mm, "Hmm." <laughs> He's like, "Okay," and literally she did that for the whole menu until we got to chicken strips and fries. <laughs> That's what she, <laughs> she wanted. Ended up going, <laughs> you know, guys, we're just really good at bar food. Yeah. like the chicken tenders are good. Trust yeah. me, the kit, the kitchen will be a lot happier if you and just order the what? fried stuff. They weren't that great. No, they really weren't, dude. Well, I thought you said I thought you said they were to die for. Well, he I was, was being, kidding. Being facetious. Yeah. Or you meant they, they wanted to make you, you die. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. That they were that bad. Okay. <sighs> Copy that. It's well, not even like. You know, when when we had Taco Bell after the show in uh Oh boy, after Detroit, Detroit. It was amazing. The shame didn't come on until afterwards. The shame at Broadway Brew House came out as soon as I saw the chicken strips before I even put them in my mouth. That's why I started <laughs> drinking. Like, what completely like washed the shame out for me is we started having cocktails. Yeah. Because if I would have just maintained my healthy thing, but I had a little setback with the chicken strips, yeah, I would have felt fucking horrible. Yeah. Okay. For those of you who don't know, we drove seven hours to Detroit, and we were we still thought we were going to drive home. <laughs> that was the plan, was and to then, go there and we come really, back. <laughs> yeah. Like, no one was... I think maybe maybe you were like, I don't know, dudes. Because you were like, I can't drive. If you guys are going to do that, I'm not yeah. driving. Right, right. When I was behind the wheel, and I remember I said Did something Did we have like, something we were trying to get back for? We were just like, let's just dead head at home. Let's just... I remember we got on the freeway. I it was, was like, the Taco Bell that really fucked us up. Oh, that dude. that's that. The Taco Bell <laughs> led to us getting a hotel and we sleeping got a hotel for like with, five hours. Dude, we pulled over within thirty minutes. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> Less we did. than we drove for about thirty or forty minutes. We all minutes slept in our clothes outside of Detroit, <laughs> and we were starving. Oh, let's get some Taco Bell. And then, I mean, I knew the second we hit the highway again after like having like three burritos in my belly, I was like, oh, I'm not making this. Well, drive. yeah, it didn't help that I ordered everything on the menu. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dude, it was so good. And it good. was twelve dollars. Yeah. But I mean, God, what we it was a what a hundred dollar room, three of us. Well, then, we got to cuddle, it was great. Yeah, we kinda got a little we, it reminded me of like early slummy touring days. Yeah, I got a little frisky, it was fun. <laughs> but think about it. We drove there, did an episode in the car, then we did an episode at Hockey Town USA. Yeah. I can't believe I just day. remembered that. I can't believe you did too. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what it was until wow. I was saying that sentence and it just came through and now, it's, and now it's gone again. And then we watched the whole show and then we, you know, that was a long day for sure. Yeah. yeah. Hey, here's the best part. For those who aren't watching, who aren't Patreon, mm-hmm. you guys have been holding your show notes since we started. Oh, I'm, I'm, We're 43 no, minutes in. Clint has not, Clint had them on the couch next to him. I I'm have set, no easy I'm, place to set I'm them pivoting, right here. I'm pivoting. We haven't even done the emails yet. Yeah, I know. We got the housekeeping. We'll I make know. it quick. Yeah. I'm going for the longest episode ever. Hey, man. I don't have anywhere to be except home and sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> except everywhere. No, we're having a good time. Dude, I'm we having got, a blast. We got Paul yeah. Mokins, HQ1. Paul Mokins in this. In, yeah, seriously. Yeah. Well, look, why don't we Why don't we uh, give everyone a little break, and then we're going to come back with a little bit of housekeeping, and then we're going to do the Black Album. That sounds good to me. All right. Let's do it. Down the beach, 
Checking out the action. Had my radio rocking to a head. All right, so here's what we're going to do. Before we listen to the Black Album, we've got to do the housekeeping. Here's the deal. The podcast has a life of its own. We've got a community of fans who love the show. We've got to do this stuff. We're responsible for this stuff, Ethan. It's a, it's a lot to bear. It's a lot, it's a, it's a lot yeah. to bear, but yet we find a way. There's always a way. Uh, who did the song Love Will Find a Way in the 80s? Was that like Saigon Kick or something? Saigon Kick. <laughs> Love will find a way. Great harmonies, guys. Thank you. <laughs> We're professionals. Yeah. Now, here's the deal. We've already mentioned that we got Paul here. You guys all know that. We did our big recap of our Metalla Week. That was nice. We're still drinking some black and whiskey. Mm-hmm. It's good. Uh, it's pretty good. There's no big, there's no one of those like rednecky stings. Yeah, I haven't stopped drinking it. It's so. kind of a gentleman's drink, right? Well, like most whiskeys, it gets better the more you drink. That's right. right. Because you can't feel your tongue anymore. Exactly. Now, we have the iTunes and Patreon. If you like the show, the bare minimum way you can support the show is you clickety-clack your way over to iTunes, you leave us a positive review. Maybe you write something funny and witty and zany and me and Ethan read it and we laugh at it. Maybe we do a little maniacal laughter like this. <laughs> 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 I didn't know I'd get to be a part of this. <laughs> <laughs> Or you just write a, hey, I really like the show. I really like when Paul Moke's on it. Yeah. All of it helps. We've Have got him a, on every week. Um, maybe we can convince him to do that. Maybe he can come on for year three. You're not too busy these days, are you? He doesn't have anything else to do. Okay. Look at me. I'm in sweatpants. I'm obviously uh, Those aren't sweatpants. Available. Those are track pants. <laughs> you, are, are, you, you are dressed kind of like, if I may say, like Jame- Jamiroquai. Jamiroquai meets Kevin Federline pre-obesity. You know what? My wife referenced K Fed today. K Fed for real <laughs> about yeah. what you're wearing. Yeah, because we, we went to lunch together, and you wore that to lunch. <laughs> Dude, oh, that's right. You, oh, that's right. You haven't changed in four days. Right. I, I can't believe we're synced up on that. Yeah. Fucking, that's a deep reference, man. K Fed. K Fed. She's like, obesity. You, you're rocking some K Fed. He's obese now. He got real heavy. Oh man. wow! Like kind Quit of working out. He just kind of gave up. Well, to Do even add heavy? to it, K Fed gives you heavy. <laughs> To even add to it, I told you guys this, but we went to a Greek restaurant. She got a to-go thing for her salad, and I'm holding it in the car, and she had dropped a paper on the floorboard, and I reached over to pick it up, and the whole salad went into my lap. <laughs> dressing and all, and I'm still wearing those pants. So you know why Love you it. know why that does tie into K-Fed? That's like that's like his brand of cologne. It's just Greek <laughs> Greek Greek salad Greek dressing. dressing yeah. Cuz that's what he always smells like these uh, days. I'm told to, according to TMZ. I yeah. would prefer if you, to match the Adidas track pants you'd have the top and then a couple gold chains, maybe a Kangol hat and <laughs> rock the run, run DMC, DMC look. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm. Raisin hell. Then Ooh, I'd be raisin cool. hell. My yeah, Adidas. Cool. My Adidas. No Adidas. That's right. My uh, have you guys watched Hip Hop Evolution? Yeah, not yet. You've mentioned it on two the show seasons. like eight hundred. Well, times. guess what? It's awesome. <laughs> I just finished season two uh, last night. It's great. Anyways, what were we talking about? Another way you can support the show. <laughs> what oh, I forgot. What I'm watching is Billions, and I just watched the episode where they fly to a Metallica concert. What's and Billions? It's a, a billions. Showtime show. Yeah, uh, it's about like um, insider trading in New York City. Okay, and yeah, yeah. But the the one of the guys who's the head of the this hedge fund flies to, I think Vancouver to see Metallica. Really, and James has a speaking role in it, wow. and it's pretty terrible. Oh, oh, I, oh, I, I was thinking it was like a documentary style show. No, no, it's, no, okay. no, no. It's a written. Okay, got it. They're like they're Metallica in the show. Okay, but uh, he says something like, I, "I'm not, I'm not going to remember it exactly," but. He said something like, do you ever have those days where you blah, 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 blah? And James is like, I just play, man. Oh, and no. It's so, you I know, just play, He man. didn't write the line, so it's not really his fault, Still, but it's pretty bad. It's, it's a little weird. And you know, like, they're just, like, comping that. They're, like, they're like going through 100 takes, and that was the best one. Oh, yeah. I just play, man. Oh, damn. I just play. I just. I just play, I man. just play, man? <laughs> I just, just play, I, man? I just You know play what? Man? I tried it from a lot of angles. I tried it from rage. I tried it from a calm collective. I tried it from curiosity. I'm an actor. I make choices. <laughs> you ever heard like De Niro talk about that? Like he talks about choices. Right. Act, acting's choices. It's choices, man. He, he gets heavy. He's one of the greatest actors of all time, right? Well, we will agree on this. Yeah. All right. Another way you can support the show is, <laughs> oh, God. is via Patreon. You're gonna hear a commercial about it later. We've got kind of a new commercial for that that goes into details about the metal tales. And uh, all the shit you get when you become a patron. It's really valuable stuff. We don't take it for granted. We'll just let that be what it is, right? Let it be. Let it 
be. Let, let it be. Paul? Let it be. Yeah, <laughs> let, let it be. There will be a patron. Let, let it be. be. At the bare minimum, what we like to do is give a shout out to our patrons. We got a shitload this week. So we, we got a bunch say, of them. We want to say thank you to them, Ethan. We have Simon Wellman, Christopher K- uh, Caldwell, uh, Johan Hansen. That's my favorite one already. <laughs> and I will say it again in, in my Torben voice. Johan Hansen <laughs> is my favorite patron today. It sounds like you're saying you're so handsome. You're, you're so, so handsome. You're so handsome. <laughs> uh, Darren Edwards, Jay Johnson. Paul, you want to read a couple? Yeah. Uh, Ryan... Enderlied mm-hmm. increased his pledge. Thank you, Ryan. Which means you guys are doing something right. That's right. I think so. Uh, Gene Froman, Kyle Hotchkiss, and Chelsea Bowen. Let's give it up for yeah, the new give patrons. It up. Give it up. I recognize several people's names in there. You know, Darren Edwards we had on the show, who yeah. works for the label. He came over and gave us a bunch of vinyl. He's Darren's an amazing He's dude. our Australian buddy who lives in Sweden. Just a, a true sweetheart. A, really, a true sweetheart. A true sweet Aussie <laughs> heart. I got nothing else. Asta La Viga. Okay, anyway. Uh, of course, Gene Froman and Chelsea Bowen. I recognize them too. So um, thank you again for being patrons. It means a lot to us. All right, we're on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and I literally wrote whatever. Because <laughs> I don't give a fuck. MetalUpYourPodcast.com. We got some other stuff going on. We are selling our limited edition Dagger logo shirts. We sold out of all our merch at the party. The merch is gone. Awesome. Yeah. It's gone. Um, which may explain the two Teslas in the driveway. Right? No <laughs> big deal. <laughs> Those didn't come from nowhere. But here's the deal. We work with this company called Everpress. Now, here's what Everpress does for us. They make it real easy for us. They make the shirts. They send out all the shirts. They cover everything. All we have to do is basically start the campaign. So for the month of February, we're selling the Dagger shirts, all sizes. They'll ship anywhere if they're 20 bucks. Yep. The links are on our various socials, honey, please. You know what those are. We also got cover over Black and Volume 1 for sale on the website for five ninety eight. What a specific number. Yeah, where'd you get that? Well, it's a Megadeth record. Yeah, it is a Megadeth record. Now, there's a few things in the news I wanted to read. A few things that make me proud of the boys. Oh, let's hear it. The first thing going on in the news is tonight, as of tonight, they're actually playing the show right now. They're playing in Cleveland right now. Wow. As, and, as we record. And then they're basically taking a break for the rest of the month. They're picking back up on the 28th in El Paso, Texas. So all of you look forward to the Metal Tales from the Road episodes. And we're going to be maybe doing some of those in between. We've got a, we've opened it up to the patrons where we're doing Metal Tales for past shows that you've been to. Mm-hmm. So we may fill some of those the, the dead time with some of those. Now, this really cool thing they're doing now where you can stream over 600 live Metallica shows at Nugs.net. Horrible website title. Nugs.net. Couldn't think of. Couldn't, is this an official Metallica thing? No, it's like you can you can get Springsteen concerts. So it's basically uh, a, okay, okay. It's basically an app you get on your phone, and I think so for twelve nineteen twelve ninety nine a month, you get uh, you get access to all these shows. Not only access to the live Metallica catalog, over ten thousand shows by Pearl Jam, Springsteen, Fish, and others. Uh, you can do a twenty four ninety nine a month high res option. And they're doing a thing now where you can get 30-day free trial. So mm. for those of you out there who spend a lot of time listening to bootlegs and various shows, it's a pretty cool thing. I'm not super into that. I, yeah, I, I like live recordings, but I'm, I'm with you. I'm not like I'm not like a fish head where it's yeah. like I'm where do you, where do you collecting use, every live I agree, show and I agree. stuff. I, I, in high school, I mean, again, I have to bring up Dave Matthews every episode now. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's, it's, it's my it's a, it's, yeah, this is it's a Dave, my mission. This it's is my a, passion. This is a Metallica Dave Matthews podcast. Anyways. <clears throat> now, I was what was considered in my high school when I was in high school in uh, the late 90s, early aughts. I was a tape trader. Yeah. I had maybe four or five hundred Dave shows, wow. mostly on cassette tape. Wow. And you refer, you, you refer to the Dave Matthews band as Dave. Yeah. Which I know you're a hardcore fan if you do that. Yeah. I went well, on Dave last night. I'm in deep. Yeah. yeah you are. They, they just put their tickets on sale and I'm going. By the way, I just did a show with Rodney with, uh, sorry, it's kind of Tangent City, but uh, um, the band Low Cash. You guys heard of them? Yeah. They're yeah. Kind of a popular country band. So their drummer, I actually watched their set. I don't know why. We were some at a festival in Miami. I didn't have anything else to do. I had a cocktail. I watched them. I liked it. Okay. You're in. Afterwards, we're hanging out all the buses and all the shit and all the catering and stuff, and I see the drummer. And I say, hey, man, I really loved your set, dude. I thought you were fucking great. And I notice he's wearing a scary guy Metallica necklace. Wow. And I notice it's the only one, it's the one you get when you have the Unforgiven experience. You mm. can't buy this. So I'm looking at his necklace, and I, I immediately stopped by saying, I said, do you have the Unforgiven experience in Nashville? And he's like, he holds, he's like, yeah. He's like, holy shit, how'd you know that? I was like, 
dude, I, I do a Metallica podcast. He goes, is it called Metal Up Your Podcast? I <laughs> no said, way. I said, dude, I'm Clint. It's me. It's me. I said, he's like, I didn't know you play. I was like, what are you doing here? I was like, I play guitar for fucking Rodney Atkins, dude. So he's a huge fan. So check, it gets even deeper. We start talking about music. I start talking about Dave Matthews. He goes, dude, I just saw my 75th show. I said, do you know what the Lily White sessions are? He was like, of course. I said, do you know what the Batson sessions are? This is some deep Dave yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah, He knew exactly what I was talking about. I said, you're coming on my bus. He came on our bus. You just found your new best friend. But we're going to go see Dave. Dave just announced tour dates. We're going to go to the national show together, and we're going to Birmingham together. There you go. Oh, my gosh. I don't even know him. His name is Harry. Harry. Wow. Oh, my gosh. This is insane. I got a story for you. Okay. Are we really going to talk about the Dave Matthews band? I would love to. I would, I would, I would honestly that. love to. We're so, uh, Dave is managed by a Red guy Light. named... Corn, corn Capshaw. Ca- corn Capshaw. Why do I know all this? Yeah. I'm insane. Uh, out of Virginia, mm-hmm. where he's from, Charlottesville. Mm-hmm. So they were managing another band that I was up for producing their record, but I had to like prove to, to the band. Like that, audition? Or yeah, yeah. So fun. the band was a big band. They're out on tour, and they're like, hey, we're playing in Charlottesville. Why don't you come up? We'll find a studio, and we'll work there. And if we like what you do, we'll hire you to do the record. Oh, that's okay. kind of uphill for you, right? Totally. Because it's not your gear. It's not your console. Totally. But, you know, All I right. wanted to work with this band. Do we get to know who it is or does that nah, remain nah, a secret? Fine. Uh, Creed. Yeah. It was actually Corn. Creed? It's why it's Brian corn. Head Welch gave me such a weird look the other night. You were the He's guy like, in Charlottesville yeah. that time? No. Um, so I fly up to Charlottesville and I get in a van. And we go out, you know, away from the airport to these rolling, not really mountains, but way bigger hills than like Nashville. Dave's studio out in the woods? It's, he he bought a mountain yeah. outside of Charlottesville. What do they call They call it something creepy. The Haunted something? Uh, haunted Hollow. Haunted I Hollow. Think. Cool. Yeah. Dude, you are deep. Yeah. Still, Steve Lillywhite designed and outfitted the studio. Okay. Basically, they bought a house that was built in the early 90s. Yeah, it looks and like a house. There's like ten houses on this mountain, and they all belong to people that work for Dave Matthews. It's like a compound or something. Yeah, and the studio is off of one of the houses, and it's about the it's maybe a little smaller than my studio, but like if everything was how a rich rock star would, you know, outfit right. a studio, really amazingly decorated and nice and. So at what point did you realize the connection to Dave? Like, this is Dave's place, but... Uh, so, the studio manager... I'm going to let you all talk. Yeah. Studio manager is I'm, like, Here's what I'm imagining. Just let me... I'm imagining, like, remember Inspector Gadget, the villain, you could never see his head. You just always saw his hand. Right, yeah, But he was always yeah. in that big chair. Yeah. I imagine you walk in, it's haunted hollow, it's all dark, and you hear that villain's voice, and the chair turns around and it's Dave Matthews. <laughs> and he's, like, petting the cat and shit. Didn't he have, like, metal hands or Yeah, something? he had a yeah. metal hand. Yeah. Are you talking about Dr. Claw from Inspector Gadget? <laughs> I don't remember his was name. Was it Dr. Claw? Yeah. It was? Awesome. He was the guy that... Yeah, No, that's actually who was there. No, I'm just kidding. Dr. Claw was uh, there. Well, yeah, Dr. Claw no, is but, Dave Matthews. So. But oh. here's the point of the story. is I, I, Of course, I knew it was Dave Matthews' place when we were going out. And and it was amazing. And you know they let me go through all the band gear to pick out... Because I, I went in a day early to set up all the gear so the band could just walk in. It's like all saxophones yeah. and violin. It was all like China <laughs> cymbals. <laughs> And uh, Roto Toms. So we're setting up to like midnight, and it's it's like one a.m. in the morning. We had made a pizza in the kitchen oven, like a Red Baron pizza or whatever. And we're eating, and the guy's like, "Hey, man, uh, I wish I knew his name." He let's just say Dave, his, Dave Matthews. Let's say his name is uh, Dave. David. Okay. David J. Matthews. He's like, "Do you want to meet Dave?" And I was like, "Who's Dave?" And he's like. He's the guy that listens to every single show and picks out the best performances from that night, and that's what they release on to their their trading website. Oh, for, so someone who works for the band. Yeah, and I'm like, he's here because we'd been there like, setting yeah. up all day yeah. by like, ourselves. He lives, he lives here. <laughs> yeah, literally, we open the door to the basement of the house, and this giant billow of of weed smoke comes out and we like walk through it and walk down the stairs and there's just a dude with two speakers and a laptop 
Wow. They just slide a pancake under the door every two weeks. <laughs> yeah, and he turns around. Alive. He's like the <laughs> nicest dude. Was his, Shakes- name, was his name Jeff Thomas? <laughs> I, I think said his name was Dave. No, I don't know what his name oh, was. Oh, this is the fake name, right? Of yeah. course. He's literally the guy that since the 90s has listened to every single Dave Matthews Band concert and picked out the songs that they release. He's like the dick picks for... Uh, right. Uh, <laughs> dick picks. Dick's picks for mm? the Grateful Dead. Okay. You, you've heard that show yeah. before. Yeah, yeah, It's like that, but he picks out the stuff for Dave Matthews, and we we listened to a show together. Wow. It was amazing. Are you a Dave fan? Uh, I've seen them more than any other band because every girl that I dated in high school wanted to go see Dave <laughs> Matthews, and I hated them because there was no electric guitar player yeah. until Tim Reynolds. Yeah. Uh, but I kind of came player? around in the last couple of years. I'm realizing that they were something that was really special. But I was too wrapped up in my Kurt Cobain, Metallica. Right. Angry at the world. Yeah. Which Dave's message is more of a seize the day, life's right, worth yeah. living. Right. That's not that cool when you're Eddie's I'm still alive and Kurt, all apologies. Right. You I come it. around to it. I'm, I still wouldn't say that I'm a fan, but I, I really appreciate. He's, he's writing really cool songs about parenthood that I think you might like in his wow. older in his older age. To check I literally don't know anything other than Ethan. By the way, the has gone to bed. <laughs> Ethan, <laughs> dude, you haven't talked in like twenty minutes. So another thing about the Dave Sorry, Matthews hey, band. Look, I know they're not the Bronx or the did, Living Inn. Did I just fall asleep, dude? Carter Beaufort can play I was different, a great si- time, by different the way. time signatures in each appendage. Of course, and keep he can. Them all. I'm just I, I, I honestly believe this. It's honestly true. believe that if Lars Ulrich, God forbid, hurt his fucking butt or something happened, and they're like, "We got a big show tonight. We're playing Glastonbury." Who can come in and fucking do this? Carter Beeford. He would be a guy you could call. He would be, of course. He's I'm, a, a I'm phenomenal you, I'm drummer. I'm telling you, he could learn the set and do it. He could. That would be a terrible so choice. So did you though. did you get the gig? Yeah, I did. You did? Yeah. The and, band, that, the band, and that was the that was the record Human Clay by Creed. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> no, the band was a band called Third Day. They're big. Oh, yeah. That was Third Day? Big Christian rock. Yeah, I know yeah. Third Day. I remember yeah. you when you did that. That's a, that was a big record for you. It was. That's yeah. That was cool. Yeah, that is cool. It it, it Mac, happened. Pa- Mac Powell, right? Mac yeah. Powell's a singer. Yeah, nice we, nice band. Nice guys. Dude, nicest guys. Uh, that happened right when my kids were born. Wow. And basically, uh, was a huge blessing to wow. us. And, yeah, now cool. and now you're in my garage recording a Metallica podcast. Look yeah. at you now. Um, Can we move on? I will please? give a million dollars to the to the co-host here who knows how we started talking about any of this. <laughs> I don't either. I, you do. I honestly want to just not read emails and listen to the Black Album at some point. But no, we we're not read doing emails. that. I know we will. Let's just we skip will. the rest we of the will. news. Let me let me break the rest of the news down for you. The, but the boys have been breaking attendance records at these arenas they're playing in. All right, yeah, shocker. It's pretty cool. Now here's the deal: you can write in. Usually we read the emails within the first twenty minutes. We're here at about an hour. The thing is, we've got a, a community of fans, and some of this shit's important to get through. And and I like to hear from them. Uh, we have a little thing called the email corner. It's metal up your podcast show at gmail.com. You can write us. Now, today I answered over 40 emails personally. Whoa. Even if we don't read them on the show, we respond to them, we read them, and we appreciate them. Here are a few that we selected. Now, you're going to read, I'm going to read, Paul's going to read. We're each going to read one email. Perfect. All right. Let's Easy. go to the email corner. Let's do it. All right, our first email is from Simon Wellman. He's an also a new patron. Thank you very much, by the way, Simon. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, hello, Clint Ethan. I'll, hash, I'll, I'll uh, parenthesis that and Paul. Uh, my name is Simon. I'm from Denmark, New Jersey, and I'm 30 years old. I just want to tell you guys I enjoy your podcast tremendously. Like almost all of your listeners, it feels like hanging out with a couple friends. That's a very nice compliment. Um, I finally caught, up, uh, finally caught up on you on uh, personally. Finally you, caught up on are you outside my house right now? It's like a scene song. your Facebook page. Um, <laughs> finally caught up on you uh, since I discovered your podcast this July, and it's been a uh, pleasant ride with you. Oh, What a sweetie. A pleasant ride. Um, I love Cover, Cover All or Black in Volume 1. It's so awesome. Uh, Clint, you got to make a Lunar Satan full album recording. I'm a big fan. There you go. Uh, you get Paul to produce it. That's all. <clears throat> yeah, that's easy. He's right there. You <laughs> ask him. Call Red everyone, Light, dude. <laughs> what if you guys did a Lunar Satan record in Charlottesville? Dude. With Dave Matthews' stoner guy in the basement. Exactly. Yes. That's all I'm saying. Uh, he ends by saying, if you're ever in Denmark, let me know, and beers are on me. 
All right, cool. Sincerely, Simon. Thank you, Simon. Thanks, Simon. Our next email is from Chelsea Bowen, new patron. I recognize Chelsea. I met her at a Matthew Mayfield show many moons ago. This is pertinent. Paul Moak is a big producer of Matthew's records. Ethan's played on his last few. He's a dear friend of all of ours. New record, Gun Shy, that Paul produced and that we played on coming out March 1st. March 1st, yeah. So uh, this is where I met Chelsea. Uh, she's super cool. She's a cop. I like having friends who are cops because mm-hmm. and like lawyers and cops because like I don't do any criminal shit. I just don't. But if you did, but I just you know how like in America we always feel guilty. Yeah, like we're just right. out of condition. Like if a cop pulls me over, if I'm not doing anything wrong, my thought isn't I'm not doing anything wrong. Cool. My thought is I'm going to jail. My thought is oh shit, what did I do wrong? Forever. Yeah, yeah. I'll oh, never. I'm, I'm, I'm going to federal. I'll prison. never see my kid again. Yeah. So Chelsea, I'm like shit. I'll call her. She'll take care of it. Uh, Chelsea says, <laughs> Chelsea says, God damn, Jason and Brantley, sure sounds like you guys had an incredible Metallica week. Thanks for being a buddy and sharing it with yep. us. <laughs> I saw Metallica for the first time in Atlanta in, in 2017. Would love to see them again before they wrap up the arena tour. My fiance's feelings are quite the polar opposite in that she loathes and reloathes Metallica and basically any heavy music. My wife's, my wife's the same way. Welcome, yeah, welcome to our marriages. My wife's always like, I hate it. It sounds so angry. I'm like, well, it is, though. My wife just says it's annoying. She doesn't mind like the ballads, though. Chelsea goes on to say, we've been together for nine years, and I've never asked her to go to any metal show with me until the Nashville one. I was close to convincing her to make the jaunt from Columbia, South Carolina, to the Metal Up Your Podcast party and the show at Bridgestone. During one conversation, she even said, that could be a really fun trip. Well, we didn't go to the party or the show. Boo. Boo. But this is why, though. About a month ago, to completely avoid going to see Metallica, she planned a vacation in the mountains for us with some of our closest friends on the day of the show throughout the rest of the weekend. I thought it was hilarious because that just 100% shows how much she hates Metallica. (laughs) But also, at the same time, it was super sweet. She could have said no thanks and we just wouldn't have gone to Nashville. Instead, we got a lovely trip away to the mountains in North Carolina. I mean, that's cool. It's pretty cool. I love the mountains. I told her today in the email, I was like, you know, like, you didn't go to the show and that's fine, but you, like, made memories with your chick and that's great. with your buds that you can't replace. Yeah. Exactly. It's invaluable. She, goes, she ends by saying, also, I just want to say thanks for all the content you guys produced for the show. I was looking at the patron-only post this afternoon on your Patreon page and holy shit, there's so much on there. It's incredible. Grateful for the work you guys put into something that brings me and so many others joy every week. Later, Chelsea. Oh, that's awesome. Thank that's you, awesome. Chelsea. It's Thank super you, Chelsea. Cool. And if we're ever in a pinch, we're gonna might need. I'm you. telling you, man. I'm gonna have to call her ass. Yeah, you seriously. got a card in your wallet when you get a DUI. That, do you know Chelsea? She's in uh, South Carolina somewhere. Listen, I know I was five miles over the speed limit. And I know I'm going to go to federal prison yeah. for this, but call Chelsea. Just, I was just drinking black and whiskey. <laughs> you know what I have in my head, though, is like the cop pulls you over and then he just throws a bag of heroin in your car. He's like, whoops, what's that? Oh, and then I'm in jail for Interesting. I've just seen too many movies. Yeah. You in the wrong state, boy. You smell good. Come here. <laughs> He's what's with that eye ring, boy? Hey, 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 boy, what's that earring in your eyebrow? What's that coiled snake shirt you're wearing? I'm going to have to look for some balloons of heroin you in your see, buttocks You again. smell like that nag champa. <laughs> All right, Paul's going to read an email All here. All right, Phil Scott, who is also a new patron. All right, Phil. Give it up for Phil. Thanks, Phil. Phil! Hey, Clint and Ethan. And no mention of me, but and that's Paul. cool. Paul? I first checked out your podcast a few months ago after hearing Tom Quee talk about you guys so much... Uh, Praise on Alpha Metallica. Give you so much praise on Alpha Metallica. I'm terrible at this. I liked what I heard and immediately went back to episode one to start my metal up journey. Nice. I'm almost caught up now, but I love the work you guys are doing. And I became a patron about a month ago. I've been a Metallica fan for decades and your podcast has given me a whole new way to analyze and appreciate their music. I've been fortunate enough to see the band six times but my absolute highlight was getting to attend both Edmonton shows and recorded through the Never film. Oh, to attend both Edmonton shows that were... Okay, the, doing through where, the Never where, where was they, recorded. Where they yeah, were recorded, yeah. yes. Jeez. You're doing good, dude. You're doing great. One of which I won both meet and greet and snake pit passes for. Wow. It was truly incredible to meet my heroes and watch the show from the best spot in the house. Keep the amazing work up with the show. I'll be on board for as long as it's around, and if either of you find yourselves my way up north in Edmonton, you can count on a beer or five from me. Stay awesome. Phil Scott, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, New New Jersey. Jersey. See, I want to start a Kickstarter for Paul to do an audio (laughs) book. I would would love to. Stuttering? It's just called The Soothing Sounds of Paul. Have you not heard me read emails? (laughs) 
There's a reason. You're pretty Clint, bad. Clint's there's a reason. Good. There's a reason Clint gives me the short ones. I know this. Okay. <laughs> I'm just making easy like, on everybody. Clint's like a, ph- a philosopher. No, he reads no, books no. all the Dude, time. Dude, I'm no, like no, that guy no. from the night before at the party who's like, "You guys don't know till you get up here, and you have to you have to remember it's really hard." And then I literally shouted, hashtag excuses. Yeah. Excuses. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next email is from Jonathan uh, Nordstrand. He says, good day, how do? Good day, how do you? Uh, just want to say thanks to you guys, and especially Clint, for in some episodes ago, talking about how uh, how listening to music where, uh, where something people actually used to do. Wait, what? Uh, I think he meant to say was. Listening was. to music was something people... Was something people used to do. Uh, that made me realize that every time I listen to music nowadays, I'm always doing something else at the same time and not giving the records the love they deserve. Uh, so lately I've tried to just sit down by the record player as often as I can with all the screens and shit turned off, with the lyric sheet and artwork in my hand and just listening to music. He says, cheers from Sweden! Nice. That's from Jonathan. That's cool. Uh, I mean, you're talking to or listening to three dudes that are advocates of that. We love listening to music and absorbing music and yeah, keep doing that, man. And not mm. only do we love it, but we make a lot of that music and that we hope someone out there cares enough to look at the liner notes or That's to right. look at maybe who produced it or who played drums on it. And, yeah. Or at least if not do that, close their eyes and get lost in it. It's not just something passive they yeah. do while they're exercising or cuz I get it, man. Life's crazy. A yeah. lot of people got a lot of shit going on. But if you can carve out that time to just listen again, like you did when you were a kid, yeah. I think it's rewarding. Agreed. Can yeah. you imagine what it would have been like in like the '60s to put on a Beatles record with your friends with the lights off? Everyone shut up. Yeah, dude. Oh yeah, I mean, the new know, Beatles record is here. Yeah, yeah. It, it was like an would event. Literally, sit down and uh, hang just on. I listen. gotta check Facebook real quick. Not what happened back then. I, but, I, it, but, I, I, but, uh, but people don't even announce it. Like. It is so hard these days. Like, if you got someone in like my studio writing, or I don't know what it's like for you working, but hey, I want everyone. Uh, we want to try to write this kind of thing today. Let's listen. How long is it before someone like has to pick up their phone? Like, people just can't do it anymore. Right. Yeah. It's an it's an atrophied muscle, and I it's hard for me too. I'm I'm not like judging it. It's hard for me too. Like, my wife and I have been talking at dinner. Like, we're just, are, we're gonna. She's listening to this guy named Rich Roll. You guys check this guy out. He's like mm. this. He's got a podcast. He's a vegan guy. He's a big health guy, but he's also yeah. you know him. You know oh, Rich. Oh we're, be- oh, we're best friends. Yeah, he lives with Dave Matthews oh, in Charlottesville. Dave? Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, he talks about how like, and this is Tangent City a little bit. I know we want to get to the Black Album, and we're going to. By the way, there's a skip function. You can skip all this if you want. Could have um, done it. But he talks about how people don't really want to look at their phones. They just do it because it's so easy. Mm-hmm. He's like, so if you basically don't make it easy, like if you put your phone ten feet away from you. Like, when we get in bed, our phones, where are they? They're right by on our nightstands. Yeah. Yeah. It's just right there. It's easy. If we're watching Sex in the City on loop, which we do at my house on HBO, that 14 seconds before the next episode, it's just crack. Grab the phone. What's going on? But it's like, if you put it to, if you have to get up to do it, you won't do it. Right. Because we really only f- throw it in our fucking visuals because it's so easy. Right. Exactly. So we're just trying to find small ways at home to sort of crack the code on our brains. To unlock some of that, yeah, because yeah. oh, we feel kind of locked into it. I Absolutely. mean, it's it's kind of like a it's a it's a drug. I mean, right. it's it, you know we we've become addicted to it. we've become reliant. It's like on serotonin. It. It's like yeah, it was like drug shit happening. Well, especially when like, it's a device that like nowadays you can make money from it, like right. on your phone, like with, people with do pornography. Air- yeah, cam, well, exactly. Pornography. Cam cam show yeah. exactly. <laughs> no, people do Airbnb, you know, drive for Lyft, do Uber, right. all sorts of things like. It, it, it can become your business. But and content, it's even way more malicious than that because content is designed to act like a drug. Right. right. The things pop up and it's shiny and it's bright and they're like clickbait and the headlines are... Yeah. It's just all designed to keep you pulling it out. It's mm-hmm. just so yeah, insidious. Mm-hmm. It's so fucking evil. Anyway, uh, thank you for saying all of that. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> Cole Roberts, who's a friend of the show, he was at our party last year. I gave him a hug, and we've talked about like we're going to give each other a hug once a year now from now on. Aww. Hey, dudes, happy to your anniversary. Couldn't be more proud of you boys. I'm even more proud to be a day one fan. Just wrapped up listening to the party and show recap, and man, the feeling of regret for not attending the party is killer. Due to my wife and I needing each other to sit down with the kiddo a few nights last week, they have a new baby. I really only had the option to go to the show, so duh, I went to the thing slash show. He went to the Nashville like actual concert. So stoked to hear it was you a good... lose. <laughs> <laughs> you have chosen oh, unwisely. That lame show. <laughs> 
He says, so stoked to hear it was a good time and that the turnout was huge. I was honestly nervous for you guys knowing it was going to be the biggest party East Nashville has ever seen. That's that's so true. I really miss getting my hug from Mr. Clint, but hopefully I'll get one in before 2020. As for the show, it was amazing, truly amazing. Been going to shows for what feels like my whole life, whether playing in them or attending them. It's been something I've done for decades, and every once in a while, you get to go to a special show. Only being a Metallica fan for roughly two and a half years, it was still exciting to see the boys. I knew it was going to be good, but it was really good. The production was insane. I really appreciated how well the show was thought out. The way the boys would move around and focus on all corners of the stage was great. It felt so thoughtful and made it seem like there wasn't a bad seat in the house. We were kind of talking about that earlier. Like, I think Chris Yerge just said this too. Is like The show has the trappings of spontaneity, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but when you kind of know what how these things move, it's pretty well thought out. Oh, it's very well thought out. I even think they have it, after seeing three in a row, I even think they go to the same parts of the stage for certain songs. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, there's even one uh, position of James's microphone where he's basically given time to the people that got the hardwired experience. Exactly. Yeah. You do you know, remember what kn- song that was? Does he do the same song? Uh, that is so fascinating because they, he, the hardwired people get to sit. They, they get, get seats, seats. Yeah. But he does give them love at a certain moment. He, he gives them love a few times. Right. Yeah. I can't remember off the top of my head, but yeah, but that, that's one seem, of those things. But it seems kind of spontaneous. Yeah. He's like, oh, right, they paid a lot of money. Hang on, let me go over there. Stay, stay which, means, which means they're doing a really good job of cultivating experience for everyone. I, yeah. I completely agree. Uh, he says, for me, I think one of the coolest things was to see the generational reach the band has. I sat next to a dad and his 10-year-old son. Seeing the two of them bond over the same band and sing the words of the songs was really touching. Even though I didn't know them, I'm glad they ended up next to me. He says, I hope to see the boys again. Overall, the show was great. To be honest, I enjoyed Jim, but thought it was funny how WWE the show felt before the boys played. True. <laughs> Seeing Lars talk to the crowd from backstage, letting us know they'll be coming out to give us an ear spanking in 30 minutes, made me wish the Hulkster was there even more. And then he says, for context, I generally wish the Hulkster is everywhere I am. Who doesn't? To Clint, don't feel bad about eating someone's burrito. Life's all about <laughs> surviving. <laughs> this was your body's way of telling you that you better eat or you're going to die. And on that note, keep up the good work. Hydrate, eat, sleep, love, and pray. All the things. Hope our paths cross again soon. It's been too long. Also, please come and talk Freddy Krueger with me on my podcast. I'm dead serious. Thanks, Cole. Cole lives here, obviously, right? He lives here, yeah. and, he, and he, uh, he has a podcast called Scary Movies and Ice Cream, where they oh, eat, that's it, right. they eat yeah. some ice cream. have been on there before, right? I was going to, but then they had a kid, oh. and you know you know how that is, and like yeah, yeah. it's his, his life got like crazy, and my life got crazy, so yeah. we're going to do it one day. You're the horror movie dude, but I, I, there are a few that I really like. I would be glad to eat ice cream and watch Friday the 13th, Jason Takes Manhattan one night. Uh, that's the eighth, I would inst- do it. the eighth installment. It is. Yeah. I love it. It's long. It's arduous. It's long, and he's only in Manhattan for about 10 minutes. But, the, but I remember when that came out, because the idea is like, because Jason Voorhees is always at Camp Crystal Lake. Always, yeah. And it's always secluded, and he's going to kill all the teenagers who are fucking each other. That's right. kind of the model. Yep. The thought of him going to Manhattan... <gasps> Was so like he's going to the big city, going to the Big Apple, and he did. Dude, you're right though. Most of the movie is him on the boat getting there. Oh, I remember texting you right. on, and, and this is tangent. It was like it was like in a, hotel. It, was like in a hotel. it was only in your hotel or something. I was on the bus coming home to Nashville yeah, was from something, and I was yeah. texting Clint like I'm watching Jason X Manhattan. Yeah. I'm an hour and forty minutes in, he's still not to Manhattan yet. <laughs> so much of it's on the boat. Oh, so much boat, dude. I'll eat some froyo and watch. I still know what you did last summer. Do you like Ooh. that one? Is that your flavor? Like the no. 90s? You're such a 90s guy, though. I know. I did love... Uh, you know why I liked... I know. What, I, I don't even know if I ever saw I Still Know What You Did, but I Know What You Did Last Summer. There's a third one, too. The beginning... I'll always know what you did last summer. <laughs> oh, For real. God. That's a real oh, yeah. thing. I'm not joking. The beginning of the first one... Uh-huh. Uh, is it Coolest Shaker? How do you say that name? Coolest Shaker. The 90s band. They covered a song... Huh? Dude, this is a... Coolest Shaker? Tang- tangent. Okay. Kula sh- Shaker or Shakur? Shakur? Shaker? Tup- Tupac Shakur. Tupac. That's Tupac. S-H-A-K-U-R. That's Shakur. I think they're a British band. Okay. What'd okay. they cover? This song called Hush. It was like a 60s. Hush, hush. Think I remember calling your name now. Hush. Oh. Do you remember that? No. I was thinking Hush, Hush. Hush. The 80s song. Hush, hush, hush. Hurry, hurry, don't you come to me. <laughs> anyway, it was good. <laughs> That's really all I had. <laughs> That's all you got. I love that. Anyway, it was good. Listen, it was people way are better so, than the movie. People are so happy that Paul is here on the show. This episode that you can talk about whatever you want, and they're not going to care. Your voice soothes people. Okay? <clears throat> well, let's talk about Adidas pants. Ma, uh, uh, Adidas. 
and Greek dressing. Our next email is from Alan Collins. Oh, great. I wonder if you guys can share anything you've learned recently about Metallica's touring logistics. I know they hub in a city for a week or so and fly in and out of shows on the day of the show. They've been in Nashville for over a week now, and we've seen them sharing some of what they're doing on their socials. Looks like they're all on their own, guessing they have friends, assistants with them. Do they fly in for shows or come in on their own and only get together when they've when they really have to be together for meet and greets and tune up. They've been a bunch of, let's see, they've made a bunch of concessions to each other in order to survive as a band, like what we saw in some kind of monster. Maybe it's a case of absence makes the heart grow fonder by not being together all the time on touring runs. Great thoughts. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Alan Collins. I have, I have a dark opinion about this. A dark opinion. Okay. Well, actually, no, it's not dark. It's just realistic. I don't think they, spend a lot of time together when they're not working. I agree. And I and that's just part of the culture of surviving as a band yeah. this long when you've been through that much. They've been rich for so long. They've yeah. got their own families, they've got their own ecosystems. Yeah. I I think maybe the first time they see each other is probably the tuning room. Agreed. I think they all share the same hotel room. <laughs> just like we did after Detroit. Yeah, yeah. James and Lars take the beds, Kirk and Rob have sleeping bags on the floor or rollaways. Right, maybe a roll away. Right, yeah, that's what I think. Um, Actually, I'm going to go ahead and debunk the myth. The first time they see each other is the tuning room because me and Clint were in catering. What thirty minutes before that? Yeah, and I watched Rob walk out to check something on his base. Right, and Kirk come in, and we knew that they were working on the doodle the for doodle, that night. Yeah. Which, by the way, they probably should have worked a little bit longer. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't the best one. Because they had to start it over, right? That pickup. Well, not only that, it just wasn't. But it, it, was, it was just weird. It's weak sauce. Dyer's Eve was cool. Yeah. Dyer's Eve was cool. Yeah. I but, think when they fly to different cities, they're all flying together. They're, they're in the when, same private jet. When they, yeah. when they can. Like when James had to go do the premiere of that movie, maybe he met up with them. No, you're right. You I, know, but I think when they're all on the same plane together. Well... Right, but that's true. We saw them when they were based out of Nashville, so they probably came for whatever hotel they're at. Right. Yeah. Here's here's my take. I think they're totally amicable. Yeah. I think, I think they love each other. Oh, yeah. they don't hate each other by any means. I think that I think that their best way to get back to what the the connection that they need to give their fans the experience of we've been a band for thirty years. Yeah. That initial spark is uh is to live life away from each other, pursue their own interests. They come in and when they come in, they bond on what Metallica is. What I agree. Sorry. Ethan's got a joke in the chamber. (laughs) So do (laughs) bringing it right back to Taco Bell. They want to live Moss. (laughs) (laughs) Would have been better if there wasn't, you know, me laughing. Sorry. Before I actually said, I should have given you a window. dude. No, it's okay. okay. I'm just not sure there's any band that can be around almost 40 years and still be friends in that way. Yeah. So let's take, they're friends, you know, but they need they, they need their space. Let's yeah. take other bands on the you know Metallica's top five pole star Creed. You know, no Scott Human Clay Clap and what's as name? produced by Paul Moak. <laughs> um, other bands would be like the Stones, Aerosmith, Aerosmith, U two, U two. Yeah, none of those guys are sharing dressing rooms or hanging out with each other, <clears throat> and it's not because they don't love each other or love the music. That's it's, how it has to work. Yeah. For the whole I think, thing to function, I think there's a lot of respect and love for what, everything they've accomplished and just all they've been through. But I don't know. Like I think you're right. I think just for them to be able to come together and for it to still be powerful, yeah, they have to have their own thing. Look, of course, man, yeah. when seven forty five rolls around and me and my wife put our kids down, you know what the first thing we do is make love until nope. the sun comes up. Nope. Alone, alone uh, time. Put on Adidas. <laughs> Say, see you in a half hour. Yeah. Yeah. Some time. She goes and does whatever she wants to do. I take a shower, have some thoughts to myself, even scroll on my phone just a little bit. See, my bit. wife and I say that on Monday night, and then I should see her tomorrow <laughs> on Saturday. We take like five days off. <laughs> hey, whatever it works. It works for us, guys. It Honestly, works for us. I have, a, I have a, a couple friend, friends who are a couple. They're, they've been married a long time. They're both so intensely independent that... It's almost like they have separate lives, but that's kind of one of the for them just for their makeup. It works. It's what's kind of keeping them rocking. Yeah, yeah. they've been together. Cool. You know, like the older we get, 
I'm seeing, you know, divorces are just, I've been, I've been divorced once. Yeah. I'm only 35. So the older I'm getting, I'm just watching it all drop off. And seeing them, I'm like, eh, maybe they're, maybe. In our 20s, we were like, these guys are weirdos, man. Yeah, they right. Have, yeah. They have no intimacy. Yeah, you get on the other side of a decade, and you're like, eh, maybe they know yeah. something we didn't know. Yeah, oh, yeah. And and relating to the boys, what I think what I think it is. Look is, at Paul pivoting back to the show know, topic. I'm just it. trying to prove this here. Yeah. Uh, I think when you get when you get a bit older, you kind of realize like, okay, what is the thing? Let's really dial it down to the essence of what this is, and because I don't have room in my life for this to be one hundred percent. Like Kirk can't have Metallica be one hundred percent of Kirk's life. Right. He's got to have other interests, and those help feed. Yeah. Like I used to spend all my time in the studio, like. 23 hours of the day and then there got to be a point where it was like that's no longer sustaining itself and it's no longer feeding what i want to do so if i if which I, is co-host metal up your podcast. Yeah. right exactly yeah so if i co-host with you guys and you can laugh and be funny about it but it is true like us doing this right now makes me fall in love with music more to where when I go back in mm, there it is. to the studio. There it is. It's what we do. We change lives. Yeah. We change lives. Even Paul's. Now, we have another email, but I, let's call an audible here and get the fuck out of here and get into Black Album Let's land. get the Black I'm ready to listen to the Black Album. Now, enjoy another little treat from the Hulkster himself, and then we're going we're gonna to kick it off with a little song called Inner Sandman. Stand by. Check out the pump, brother. Wanna know? What's up, dude? I was born, I was bred, I was southern fed. Got a crazy idea running through my head. California is a place that I had to be. Then a speech in the pit really set me free. Oh, yeah. Check out Pythons, baby. Hey, it's Clint from Metal Up Your Podcast, and we hope you're enjoying the Metal Tales from the Road series. If you've been keeping up with us, then you already know that we've covered every stop on the 2018 2019 North American Arena Tour, and we look forward to catching up with all of our European friends later this year on the Stadium Tour overseas. And there's more. After the Stadium Tour, we are continuing the Metal Tales series for any Metallica show in the past. Maybe you saw one of the Orion Festivals. Maybe you were at the Channel in 1984 and Cliff Burton bought you a beer. Maybe you were at one of the 30th anniversary shows, or you just saw a regular-ass show in North Dakota somewhere. We want to hear from you. Since Ethan and I started Metal Up Your Podcast, we've wanted to find a way for listeners to call in and share their stories. Well, this is it. To make yourself eligible for a future or past Metal Tales episode, please consider joining us on Patreon. For $5 a month, you not only get to come on the show as a guest, you also get both of our Cover Our World Blackened EPs, monthly giveaways like deluxe box sets, rare vinyl, posters, and other goodies. You get early access to our YouTube videos, and we also let you ask our guests, like Ray Burton, Michael Wagner, Hailstorm, members of Slipknot, your very own questions. For what essentially amounts to two cups of coffee a month, you can ensure that Metal Up Your Podcast continues to grow in quality and content. For any of you on the ride with us, we love you, we thank you, peace, and adios. <laughs> <laughs> all right boys let's uh let's toast let's cheers to one of the greatest metal records of all time so much clinking i texted ethan this to, i think it was this morning i said dude i'm legitimately excited to listen to the black album mm-hmm. with you guys tonight i will admit Ever since we started talking about this episode, which was 48 hours ago, I haven't listened to the Black Album because I wanted to appreciate it. Well, here we are. And by the way, uh, I'm just going to start. I'm not tired of this I'm throwing a comment out right away. Okay. I love this song. Always have, always will. One of Lars's coolest drum beats. Yeah. How it builds up with the guitars. I totally agree. It's not the the exact riff right away. Just round in. It's complimentary. Yeah. Then it brings in the snare drum. The snare with the crash hit. Oh yeah, he loves that on too. So Big build up here. Lars. 
Oh. This is the greatest metal song of all time. That's what I'm going to put out there. It is. It's great. Thank you, Kirk, for and writing I'm, this. Riff. And I'm still not tired of it. I'm not either. I'm not the one at the show that's like, after nothing else matters, I'm walking up the stairs, leaving. No. To get, you know, out, out of traffic. I can see exactly what he looks like when I hear this vocal. It's Strobe like, light. It's that, it's the year and a half of the life imagery and that video. Yeah. Yep. The kind of mullet. The, the the mustache she kind of has now. He kind of had the the Fu Manchu, Fu Manchu going right. into a beard into, a little bit, yeah. kind of. But what do you think about the like the childlike nature of the lyric of the song about being kind of child nightmares? We talked about it. We you know Ethan and I did the Alpha Metallica Inner Sandman episode with Tom Queen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It doesn't occur to me like some of the like fairy tale imagery. It doesn't occur to me. I think because like, because like, it's snow, me- like he actually says Snow White. Because it's Metallica, I feel like it, it's there's a pass. You know, <laughs> yeah, I agree. it's James Hetfield. This is Snow White line. Yeah, I wonder if that makes it even creepier though. Yeah, Dreams of Dragons, or at least relatable to anyone in any generation well what they what he nailed which is kind of amazing he kind of nailed this before he had kids because sometimes your kids wake you up and they yeah he kind of nailed the sort of imaginative nightmare scape of what it's like it's it's collages of all those things yeah it is my kid in her sleep the other night said um she was like tossing and talking and she said uh thank you very much but can the princess poop now (laughs) <laughs> in her sleep, yeah, that's what wow. she was dreaming about. Was she playing? Just think that might have been verse. That might have been verse three of Inner Sandman. Yeah. Well, I just wonder if that makes if that broadens the appeal that it's so, rela- like everyone on this planet has had a bad dream. Right. A everyone on this planet woke up and a semi truck almost ran over their bed. Yes. Oh yeah. Not, not but in there. But they smiled because at the very same time, Lars hit a snare in a crash, <laughs> and James went. Ooh. Bring the beat back know. from the intro. Bring that beat. I love this here, we go, here, here we go. Right here we go. Here we go. Oh, that's that. I mean, Lars has been doing that thing since Who's the first. Who's the girl record. in this? Who's it's the girl not the girl. It's Bob Rock's son. Bob Rock's son. How dare you call him a girl? How dare you guys know that? Because <laughs> um, it's in the year and a half left metal. Well, you, they don't talk about. It. You see it, the kid recording it, but it's Bob Rock's son. I think that Lars is like Matt Sorum on the Use Your Illusion records. Yeah. The Pat Boone, Debbie Boone of yeah. November Rain. His drum parts are hooks. Oh, yes, yeah. They, oh, absolutely. Dude. Absolutely. I love the chorus as a key change, too. Up to F sharp. Yeah. Dude, the pushes. This one right here. Repeat chorus. Ugh. Great vocal performance by James. When you got a chorus that good, you got to fucking drive it in. I love in a year and a half when he's doing one of the choruses and he goes, "Whoa, on. Yeah. Well, because you know Bob Rock. All right. Well, shh. Bob Rock was producing the Cult. Shh. Boom. It's the best. Is he saying boom or ooh? I always thought it was ooh. I thought it was boom. (laughs) Right. Boom. Well, let's add that to the master list of things to ask, Mr. Jimmy. And then reversing the intro here. Yep. You mean the, as far as the drums? Drums and guitar. And then they get rid of one of the notes. Look at this motherfucker. It's the, it's the, Teaching it's the, me things about the, the song I didn't even know. It's the opposite of what they do on the intro. I yeah. never noticed that. Yeah. I guess I'll see myself out now. And oh. the Nashville fade, dude. The Nashville, Nashville fade. fade on oh, the first I love track. that. That's funny. Which really, how else could the song end? Like it does live. Yeah. yeah. You could, yeah. I like it. It's not as cool to me. But it fading out kind of feels more nightmarish. Especially on the music video. Right. Like watching MTV in the 90s. Exactly. I couldn't wait for this to come back around. Mm. Yes, yes, we want heavy. Love, Love this, Phil. It just seems like he wasn't concerned at all with like impressing anyone with speed. No, because it's kind of he's playing here we go, parts. Here we go. What? Oh. 
It's so fast compared to the show. Uh, it is faster. Here we go. Snare and crash. That's, oh, that's, that's, that's Lars, man. That's his thing, man. That's, that's his the thing. swagger, dude. That's his signature. It's like this little explosion he throws out every once in a while. What I love is that I can picture him when he hits it. With his he tongue whip, out or something. Whips, or? He had long hair at the time. He whips it back. Yeah. So it's like, bah, bah, da, 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 boom, bah. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. He does that for sure. Bob hey. Rock. Hey, hi. Hello. Hello, James. Bob Rock called this the cashmere of the 90s. I agree. Whoa. That's what he said when he heard the demo, and he told them to slow it down. I thought that Puff Daddy song was the Cashmere of the Come with 90s. me? Come with me? From the God, from that, Godzilla. Yeah. Godzilla Wasn't that soundtrack. Cashmere? Yeah. Come with me. Uh, duh, that's the Cashmere of the 90s. I think Cashmere was the Cashmere It literally was Cashmere in the 90s. Produced by Paul Moak. Triplet. Dude, the keyboards on this. That's Kirk. No, no, no. There, there's, remember, no there's, remember that dude? Oh, yeah, they the guy that looked like Vancouver. The guy that looked like uh, Fabio. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he looked like Bob Rock. <laughs> they looked like the same guy. And he had this whole computer that like ran all the keyboards. It was like keyboards. ADAT or something. That's the... Wow. Because he's working the pitch wheel. <laughs> what are you this laughing is, at? This is why we have Paul here. He's working the pitch wheel. Gotta work that pitch wheel. It's my favorite part. Don't when, judge me. Hey guys, no, I love it. When in doubt in life, just work the pitch wheel. Dude, I'm working the pitch wheel, man. I work the pitch wheel all the time. Love this video as well. The what kind of live montage? Yeah. See, Kirk does a pretty good approximation of that, though. I think yeah. it's doubled. With he does kind of an edgy, now. delayed. Fine, Kirk's in there, dude. He's in there, man. Come on, Kirk. I think this is a brilliant song, man. It's yeah. just Hook City. Yep. Interesting drums, man. I think the drums are perfect for this song. I love this. The him following the, you know it's sad but yeah. true. That's so original. Ding, 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 ding. Yep. Yeah. I mean, that's. I think that's a, that's a pretty common thing with Lars and James. They, I mean, they're the core of the songs, you know? Here we go. Isn't it crazy like we know where all these are? Thing. Yeah, I know where every single yeah. one is. Hold on, hold on. Here we go. Shh. Paul, Paul, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> pretty good solo. Yeah. That's, I love the solo. Uh, pretty good. Great, love it. Good job, Kirky. Great BGVs. Yeah, James killed it a lot. I know Jason probably did some stuff on here, but James did a lot of his own harmonies, and he really did a great job. Yeah. That's my favorite one. Kind of a little solo reprise. Yeah. The only time I like a Jackson guitar is when Kirk plays it on this song. Yeah. Double. Go, 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 go. That feels voice there, changes. Isn't there a scene in a year and a half where James is doubling the... Yeah. He's, he's got just, like a baritone or something. He's just going... Dun, gum, gum. Gum. It's on the gum, chorus. Gum. And it's making the I camera... I think it's on the verses. Gum, gum. Isn't it making the camera shake in the video? I don't remember that. Yeah. No, that's when Jason is behind his uh, his foam bass it's wall. It's the bass yeah. making it. Yeah, yeah, I love they follow the, the old school format on the song, too, of like third verse after the solo. Yeah. But it doesn't feel... It still feels new. It doesn't feel that way, yeah. Yeah. You know what it feels like to me? A fanny pack. It does. And a blouse. <laughs> and ponytail I love switching holders. to the crash symbol right there. Oh, uh, never noticed that either. Mm. Ooh. Ooh. Yes. 
Yeah. <laughs> now this, I think, is if you're like an old school Metallica fan, this is the point where you're like, okay, here we go. This yeah. is the one Bob Rock thought should be the single. Do yeah. you think? Do you think people were freaked out up until this point? Oh yeah. And then they're well, like, okay, it's definitely be for, fun. Definitely for so. Sandman. Yeah. Yeah. Sabbath even true. Sabbath True, that's like definitely their slowest tempo. But even but even a true would have to admit. I mean, the thing that should not be slow too. Yeah. So is Harvester yeah. of Sorrow, Orion. But sad not, is, not as slow. But, but sad is so heavy. I think even Trues were like, yeah. "Well, it's heavy at least." Right. I think Understand Man probably freaked them out though. Great riff. Clint's still doing like Ringo Starr head. <laughs> peace and love. Bobble peace head, and love. Peace and love. Did you talk about on your radio episode? being starstruck and you didn't mention Ringo Starr I didn't mention Ringo Starr I don't know why he's like who have been starstruck by um you met Ringo I met Ringo yeah you never told me about this he was on Jules Holland no this he was, was at, at the, the uh, at the Kennedy Center Honors thing for what artist I was working for Kings he was he was he introduced Kings that night who who were they the Eagles sorry okay yeah and you met him? I met Ringo in catering after the show, just sitting there, and he he was there, and I just said, fuck you it. You met a Beatle, I met dude. a Beatle, yeah. He didn't even mention it today. Stop the podcast. Stop. Hang on. We're going to stop real quick. I'm just kidding. You're holier than thou, dude. Try to be. The crap rolls out your mouth again, man. Sometimes it does. Bah, bah. So, like I said, if you're an old school thrash guy, this isn't the fast thrash beat, but this is like... Fast eighth notes to, to on me, a this, hi-hat. To me, this sounds like Justice. Yeah. It's got sort of the anger of Justice. Yeah. If you had this, if you could imagine this song with Justice production, it, right. would fit, it would fit just fine. I agree. I even think if, if this is the first single that had come out, there wouldn't have been like the, wait, what's happening? Here? But here's the deal. Here's why that wouldn't have worked. They would have bought the record and then had the same problem. I, right. I think the way it played out was how it totally should have. Because this isn't a single. But isn't this what Bob wanted? Yeah. He was think probably he, thinking what I'm thinking. I think he was worried. Which means I'm on the same level as Bob I Rock. I think it means you are Bob Rock. Just get that waterfall ponytail, man. And yeah. the fanny pack. Great guitar parts here. You know what sucks? Well, it doesn't suck, but... And you're right about Justice right here. I love this how it goes major right there. Oh, yeah. Da-na-na-na-na-na-na. Yep. This was in one of the rotating slots. I mean, they've been playing this on this tour. I know. We missed it. Great solo. What's Kurt played on this song? On the tour? What, guitar? Yeah. I don't know. I haven't seen video of it. You just looked at me like I was asking what instrument he was playing. No, I thought you were making a wah joke. What's... Oh, okay. Like, what's that thing that makes it sound like wah, wah, wah? Okay. Because he, you know, Kurt Kurt wah it. A little Newstead moment here. Get him, Jason. Get him, Jason. Jason, Jason. Brantley. <laughs> Jason. Jason it's Brantley. Brantley. I'm Stay in the band, man. <laughs> Stay in the band. Jay- Call me back. They're Jay- wanting to kick you out. Jason Brantley, listen, man. This Echo Brain thing's gone far enough, man. <laughs> Be a buddy. Quit Echo Brain. Call me back. <laughs> <laughs> Jason Brantley, man. James is not happy, dude. Give me a call quick. Jason Brantley, listen, you may want to still you may want to lay low with James for a little minute, man. He's a little mad at you about Echo Brain. Buddy right, though, man. call me back. It's me, Kirk. Bye. That's right. Bye. All right, joke's mm. over. Song begins. Dude, this video oh, this so was good. destroyed Great video. me. Yeah. So weird. It still destroys me. Every video they released for this record, I remember being that age. I was, you know late junior high almost into high school and it was just like oh my god this is scary and dark and and it's like what, nothing I'd ever heard the thing is it still is and yeah. you look at other it videos is. from that era and they're comical yeah but this one holds up man yeah. even other Metallica videos from this era. Lars Backbeat so good a little sitar in there classical Yep, nylon string. Hey, let's make the verse as heavy as we can. Here Love we go. That. I never have seen them actually talk about that, but I bet they were kind of like... I've seen Lars talk about it. Like, the chorus gets chill, but it's the verses that are heavy. Look, I'll do my best Lars. He's okay. like, 
You know, we never we, we never heard a song where like the verse was heavy and the chorus was quiet. So we thought, let's make the verse as heavy as we can. This is a terrible Lars. Um, but he, um, guys, <laughs> um, we never heard like we, um, to we this did it. Level. Look, we made an aggressive album with a positive message. Was that saying anger when yeah. he was saying that? <laughs> <laughs> but it's basically that. But he was saying. I mean, for them, it course. was a new thing. This is, and, and it worked great on this. It worked perfect. But a lot of trues at this point were like, hey, what hey. What are these sissies talking about? But Never but free. But to me, this, this is just as good as Fade to Black. I, Yeah, I think you could argue it might even be better. More, Can we talk more too fully about, realized. I don't know how... I mean, we're just kind of off the cuff. No, fun, no. But... This lyric still actually haunts me. This is why they stand above. It's not dumb metal yeah. tropes. I I I listened to this a month ago and was like, God, man, there there's so much depth into what's happening right now. Yeah, that's relatable to any human life. Could you imagine? Could you Real imagine? Quick. Yeah, go ahead. Love this drum part. Playing the hi hat, quarter note hi hat. Yeah, I was gonna dude. say something so fucking deep, dude. Yeah. I was gonna go so fucking deep. We're talking about life, and he's talking about the drums. Sorry, I just had to point it out. Well, now it's gone. No, go for it. No, it's gone. The moment's passed. No, sorry, you're talking about the Inner Sandman or something. <laughs> <laughs> Inner Sandman is awesome. That's all I it wanted is. to say. I was saying, imagine being Bob Rock, and you got an artist like James in there with that kind of material. So your kind of job is to also shepherd that and figure that out, but Bob Rock had to have some like quiet moments where he was like, "Fuck, yeah, yeah, this is some good material." Man. Yeah, and and James really, I mean, on a song like this, singing like he really hasn't ever sung before. Let's pause for Kirk's best solo. Kirk's of all time. best solo. I'm just wondering if I can take it to a higher plateau, bring it down, <laughs> and then take it even further. Man, I gotta work on my impersonations. Yeah, it's really just you saying it <laughs> in a slightly different <laughs> register. <laughs> but he really does it. Watch. He's reaching the peak, just like he talks about. I love this. Right? Now, let's take him down and bring him back up again. Here we go. God, they can. And then I love in the movie. Bob reaches up and grabs his volume knob on yeah, his guitar he turns and it turns down. it down. It's like classic producer. So brilliant, man. So producy. Oh, this song. You, so you'll never, you never feel as cool as when you're doing something like guitar and the producer like starts messing with the pedal while you're doing it. Yeah. Or touching something. <laughs> yeah, you're I've like, seen, I've seen Paul do that. You're like, I'm really yeah. doing something over here, man. Yeah. He doesn't want to interrupt me, so he's going to take care, take the reins on here. Well, on because you're not an octopus. You only got two arms, as exactly. far as I know. Well, you got the third arm. What? Well, as you know. The kickstand. And dude, these strummed acoustics that come in right here that are kind of major. I would yeah. love to see how many guitars are actually on this outro. It's gonna be like thousand. It's got to be like 20. Yeah. yeah. Especially like this dude right here. They're kind of like Ebo kind of sound. It's all kind of droney shit. There's steel string. There's nylon string. Yeah. There's clean electric. One of Hetfield's, uh, in my opinion, one of his best deliveries is coming up soon. The You Label Me line. You Label Me. Oh. Dude. Did you think James just walked in the room? Yep. It's coming up, man. Never me. me. Jason Brittley. <laughs> be a so, how dark, how, dark, how dark are we going to get? It's dark, as dark as the Black Album. It's right there. The label you. That's so good. I fucking love the so, I fucking love here's what I take out of this song, and I'm really actually speaking to the 
the people listening to this podcast. <laughs> well, that's right. good. How are you? That's good. <laughs> that's good. Welcome, everybody. Paul Can, Moak is here. What I get out of this tune, are some people born privileged? Mm. Do some people have a shittier go at life with the, with the out cards, of the womb? The cards stacked yeah. against you. That is my question based off of this song. I say yes. That is really bothersome to me. Yeah. It's a heavy concept, for yeah. sure. You bothersome that I said yes? <laughs> no, no, no. Just like, or, that, or that that's, that's, that's the what, debate. How it, that's, that's the debate that yeah. that's true. Yeah. I want to have, that I've had I in private. You're mad at me for a second. I was yeah. like, oh, shit, what did I say to Paul? No, dude, we're all equal. Well, even James said it at one point. He said, we all have the same, we're born with the same size soul. You know? That's true. Speaking of Lars Backbeat, and second song in a row that has some uh, some sitar. I didn't, and know I, that, love that I didn't little... know that was sitar and Unforgiven. At the beginning? I didn't know that was sitar. It's in there somewhere. It's, it's tucked in there, yeah. I think. I, they have to go to double time there, but it kind of takes some of the power out. Because that... Yeah, it's pretty yeah. dirgy. It's so creepy. The halftime thing kind of gets come, like... It comes back five times in the song. No, when they go back to halftime for the verse... And how about hearing... The tease of the verse. Oh right. yeah, and what Dude, a weird I've move. A- oh, sorry, it's after they go. Right here. And the road becomes my bride. And the road becomes it's a weird arrangement, man. But can you imagine it any other way now? No, but you know they had conversations about that. For sure. Oh yeah. I am glad we. I am glad we got this on the stadium tour. Yeah, yeah. I kind of miss it. Me too. People are like, it's kind of black album heavy. The tour. I'm like, <laughs> the black album yeah, is fucking. So is my life. So is my butt. Oh, this here. Jason Brantley, call me what you will. Call me what you will. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Jason Brantley, call me what you will. Bye. I love the 16th note here. Oh, get a little disco I've never noticed there. that. Quick little did disco either. part, yeah. It's cool. Don't say disco, dude. I, I said, said disco I said tech. 16th disco tech. Those little trills. I love little trills. When I was younger, I just thought it was da 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 da, but it's da 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 who do you think speaking before James? James. James. It is. It just sounds like him going. And the earth becomes my throne. I want to think it's Jason. By myself. I know. I want to give him a shot in there with his glasses. I love that clean guitar that comes in. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. God damn it, this song is so good. It's so yeah. good. Good fill. 16th note, here we go. It gets a I've little, never noticed it, that. It's dude. this big. It's not that big at all. It's it's crazy. Yeah. Love this. <laughs> Let's just replace all the guitar parts with Paul <laughs> singing them. Perfect. I'm sorry. I feel like I'm over contributing. <laughs> there it is, dude. Yeah, every time. Wow. Freaking kiss up in here. Yeah, I was made for loving you. <laughs> Dynasty. Good Kirk solo. You got the Kirk move, dude, when he goes up on his leg oh, yeah. like that. It's for the YouTubers at home, they can't see. Sounds like Steve Vai for a minute. Dude, you know what I liked about going to the tuning room? 
We saw Kirk's Wah. What's the uh, the brand? ghoul? Yeah, the, yeah. The ghoul. But did you see they didn't have the cable plugged into it because it drains the battery? So it's just like yeah, it's, like, it's like us in our bedroom. Wait, they yeah, didn't have, they didn't have a power supply plugged into it. No, no. Wes. It's, a, it's a total yeah. nine volt. Total nine. Well, volt. No, but some people who play those Wahs, they like the battery sag. But there's a setting on like the Voodoo Lab power supply. You can, you can do set that. sag. No. Are his, are his walls on stage like that? Surely not, right? No, the walls on stage are completely they're, they're power, plugged yeah. in. Yeah, because they 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 remember in the stadium tour they had them up and it was well that was just in St. Louis it was raining they had little bags on them. Yeah, they how like, does that work? They must be remotes remote. to one crybaby unit. Or I something. think his crybaby unit is a rack. Yeah, yeah, it's like slash. Yeah, yeah. So they're just sending some kind of. Electrical signal, but the, to the, rack. the guitar's not running out to the right. wall and back. Right. Yeah. But he's right. The little input jack was just right. Yeah. yeah. Like me in seventh That's grade. Cool. Yeah. After I learned the hard way. Yeah. You go to fucking turn it on, no signal. Turn it off, signal. Yeah. But what? no wall. What's happening? What's happening? What's uh, happening? Wah, what's happening? Uh, uh, another country music, another Nashville fade out. Another Nashville oh, fade. Oh, yeah. But I like this one, too. It's long for me. It's really long, but but what I liked about this when I was younger is I would keep turning it up. Yeah. I had to know what James was saying and what Kirk was playing. He's just saying wherever may wander in Rome. And I know now. What do you think happened like five seconds after the... Exactly. Like, did they play this for another minute? Probably another 24 hours. At yeah. least. That's what's so great about the fade. The magic trick of the fade is when you're a kid... You imagine they just keep playing it forever. Yeah. That's what's so great yeah, about they're Fade. still playing it. Like I'm a big fan of Fades on records. Yeah. I like the illusion that they they didn't want to stop. Yeah. Let mm-hmm. them figure like out how this. to do it live. Like exactly. This. Love it. Just like this podcast. Oh my gosh. We're going to fade out this episode. Totally. Let's do it. Can we please do it? We're going to. Okay. While, we're, while we're still talking. Yeah. I think we're going to. <laughs> Ooh. Okay. Come on, man. Paul, is it Well, I don't know what that means. The tempo. Either. Is that the tempo? No, no, hold on, hold on. Let me do it. No. Or is it? Do you, no. Yes. Oh, the well, intro's well, fucked that, up, though. Yeah, it's this. Yeah, it's swung. Dun, 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 but it dun, sounds dun. like it could be the other way. If you don't think of it swung, it could be that tempo. You're ruining that, the song for me. That right fucked now. with me for years. You're ruining the song for tens of thousands of people. I'll shut up now. Dude, don't tread on me. Don't tread on I'll, the tempo of this song. You're in my fucking house. I will tread over both your asses tonight, okay? And I mean that in a sexual way only. Well, this is this is my second least favorite song on the whole record. What? But I still love and it's it. It's still great. What's like, your least favorite song? I'll save it. Okay. For when it comes. Do you know what it is? I'm pretty, you could probably I'm probably pretty sure I know what it is. But I love this chorus. So be it. Settle the war. The. To pieces. To secure pieces to prepare for war. Dude, this song is amazing. Settle the score. Isn't it weird to think about this record of, of, of you having a least favorite song? Well, this one's gotta be. What's your least favorite song on the record? I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to guess it's Inner Sandman. It could be. It could be. Love the chromatic verse there. Yeah. It's got a good chunky... Dude, all I know is... You said it earlier. You see me running through 12 South. I run a lot to the Black Album. When it gets to this song, it doesn't matter if I'm going like a half mile an hour because I can't run anymore. This song comes on and you're like, oh yeah. But you're singing Don't Dread on Me. Yeah. Don't Dread on Me, exactly. Because <laughs> of, you know, the dreadlocks. So be it. I'm saying Don't Text to Me. I like doing the barbershop snap to it. Cha. 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 That's like a fucking... That's like two cats fighting in the middle of the night. It, it's awesome. I've never I've never thought of it that way. One of my favorite Kirk solos in this record. It's definitely original. This part here. 
dope. It's cool. He is such a great guitar player. It, He's what, so what, capable of doing some such special shit on yeah. a record, man. What he put on this song is is this whole record. I mean, he he really shined on this album. So be it. This chorus is so hooky, man. To secure pieces. It's like the it's I think it's as catchy as it's like the escape of the Black album. You are really killing it tonight, and fucking man. Lars swinging it back that there. That is very yeah. astute of you, man. This is totally the escape of the Black yeah. album. Yeah, it is. When was the last time they played this live? <laughs> Prop. Well, good have question. They? Black album era. They have played it live, yeah. but not a lot. And James has said in press that he doesn't like it very much. I wonder why. He's talked about how the Gulf War was happening, and they were uh-huh. like watching it in the studio, and it, you know, it's kind of like this pro-America, pro-war, to secure peace is to prepare for war. It's this pro-war thing. And I think this that hasn't aged as well. Right. Right. I get that. Now this this is, shit is to, to me this is the, this is the gem of the Black Album, the hidden gem. Paul is standing. Paul is standing up. Let this, it be. Let it be known that Paul is standing up. He's adjusting this is the mic also, down. Are you about to is this scream cool? in the microphone? No, no, you, no, can, no. Just, oh, you just want to stand up. That's this, fine. Stand this up. is literally the first time this has ever happened. You can stand see up. it on YouTube. This guy, look right here. There we go. There they go. Look at it. Is that guy from Corn? Yeah. (laughs) Just hanging on that E. All downstrokes. It's fast too. Oh yeah. It's this is a real fun song to play on guitar, by the way. I've never learned it. It's fun. But then he goes into this groove. This is like Pantera. Ever, ever was, will be, ever, be, die, do They've done this song on the tour, too. Yeah, this is one of the rotating songs. Really? I really was hoping we were going to get this it's, in it's Nashville. It's generally a slot four song. Yeah. Which we got, uh, what did we get in slot four in Nashville? Uh, slot four, we got... Um, Why can't I fucking think of it right now? Oh, we got Harvester. Harvester, yes. God damn it, this song is so good. Dude. I know. Dude, in the movie, this song is so good. Through the Never? They don't play it in the movie. Through the Never? They don't play it in the movie Through the Never. Is it in the credits? Uh, it might be in the, no, no, during the credits the, no, or Orion. During, during the credits, they're playing Orion live on stage. They've, they've done it on other like live DVDs, but they didn't do it in Through the Never. Weird. Key change. Dude, this song has a great... Check yeah. it out. Oh, it's coming up. It's right here. Check this out. Sorry, it's after the fashion. Sorry. Yeah. One of the best bridges. With this like tribal on through the never thing. E flat, E flat. What is it? It's D G B flat. B flat D. Apparently we have Mozart at HQ1. <laughs> uh, I can't tell I'm actually the deaf. Never we must go on through the never <laughs> on Pause. through the never. The people on YouTube are in for a treat. <laughs> they really are. The people on the podcast are just going to hear a, a mic stand going like this. They're going to love it. Exactly. I like he comes in on that. Yeah. Are you sure this wasn't in the movie? It's one of the big weird faux pas. Dang it. They didn't play Trapped Under Ice at the Freeze a Mall gig. No Through the Never in the movie Through the Never. 
They didn't play Lulu in Nashville. What's their problem, man? Lulu. Oh. Oh. <laughs> What a great Lulu song. Right what a great song. Yeah. Lulu. That's the hidden gem on the Black Album, in my opinion. Oh, dude. Right here. My favorite video of the Black Album era. The live montage of this well, yes. one? This was one of the first... Gl- oh, this gl- like studio clips. Yes. This is before a year and a half left Metallica came out, so this was the first glimpse in the studio where you're like... Oh my god, he's playing a Gretsch. Oh my god, he's doing this. I didn't even know what a Gretsch was back then. I didn't either. Yeah. I just knew that Lars wore a, a workout band a around over his, his headphones. Yeah. yeah, and he taped up his fingers. He had green, like green padded drumsticks, and watching them work in the studio was yeah. like, it was all in slow motion. It See, was that's amazing. What I, that's what, and you know, we're a bunch of '90s kids who could go on this forever. But that's what I miss about that is like. You would, I would stay up all night to wait for this video to yes. come on, yeah, because I couldn't get enough of it. And then you would just, you would study shit like that. Yeah, the drumsticks were taped with green. And yeah, totally. There's that Gretsch. I think. No, there's video of that him doing that. On Is the that Gretsch. the one from the Gretsch? The, the dive from? Yeah. Okay. Dude. Jason's haircut in this video is what I'm modeled after right now. You're rocking shape, it right now. The shaved sides, sides of the yeah. head. Long hair. I just need some big glasses. He did was wearing some kind of big 90s glasses. He was. Life is ours. Jaws way. Life is Lars. Life is Lars. <laughs> we live at Lars way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... They probably got a lot of shit for the song and being like probably their most ballady song of all time, because it never goes a thrash. However, this is a and solo. this is an incredible song. To oh. me, to me, this entire song until the solo ends is an uphill climb to an explosion, and then it finally happens, and then it like just trails off nicely. Is that a good assessment, yeah. producer? And it's all uphill, bigger. Yeah, it never the- it never sucks down. No. Until the until the outro, right? And the subtle orchestra, there was yeah. a Michael Kamen. Michael yeah, Kamen. behind this is the K Man, K Dog. I guess it does come down a little bit right here. It does come down here. Ding, just ding. a touch, just a, uh, not a fall in valley, just a little bit. It's after the next chorus. Well, this comes down to but, but see, there's a hypnotic quality to it because he repeats the same verses. There are only yeah. three verses. He does all three of them in the first go around. So Forever then trust who we are. Dude, this is another one. Lyrically, I have so many questions. Okay. Do you question not pontificating? Let's, let's, let's hear them. I can answer them. At least believe. one. It is the message in this song. What what my truth is is the only truth that matters. I think what he's saying is the thing the connection I have with this person is the only thing that matters. Okay. The trust I seek and I find in you. Every yeah. day for us something new. Open mind for a different view and nothing else matters. What we're doing together, the journey we're on is the most important thing yeah. in my life. Everything outside of that doesn't matter. I never open myself this way, but life is ours. We live it our way. All these words I don't just say. I'm telling you, nothing else matters. Do you think that, who's it's that about person? Metallica? It was like about his girlfriend at the time. Wow. It's kind of just like a breakup song. But heavy, heavy life themes. That's the brilliance of James. Yeah. Yeah. He so wrote Master of Puppets. Way. He wrote Master of Puppets way before he knew he was an addict. Yeah. And he had to realize twenty years later that master the, the you know that was about him. Yeah. Yeah. Matter. This is when he was listening. They were talking about Chris Isaac in the studio. Oh yeah. Yeah yeah. They were referencing foolish uh, wicked game. Wicked, wicked game. game. Yeah. Because he was listening to Chris Isaac, think, he was like, "I want to do that." I think his vocals on the song are so good. He keep, like I said, he keeps bringing it up and up and up. Gets a little bit growlier up until the chorus, and his best yeah is coming up. It's a yeah, yeah. His, his best yeah, yeah of all time. Of all it's time, it's the only yeah, in, yeah, in my opinion. Even of the loads, a lot of yes and loads. There are, but this is my favorite one. It's coming up here in a okay. second. And I will say, James's solo coming up. Oh, yeah, it's great. Here, here we go. Let's embrace it. Let's okay, listen to sorry. it. 
That's yeah, yeah. yeah. I think he's got a touch a lot of guitar players could envy, including myself. There's a few little moments on his left hand of vibrato happening on certain That's notes what I'm saying. that are he's so got a, good. He's got an interesting touch. I, I think this song is to Kirk. So close, no matter how far. Touch my solo, you son of a bitch. <laughs> I think that... I'm kidding. It's a good point. But I do think that even when I was a teenager, thinking... God, that solo is so much better. And it's not... It, like, is, it Kirk, is a good solo. Kirk, Kirk has his own style, and The Flash is amazing and all of that, but there's so much soul and so much of James coming through that solo that I connect with as a human. Every you know? note of that solo like plays perfectly with the chord changes. Have, yeah, you, guys ever, have you guys ever wondered to this p- exact point, why hasn't James done more? Think about it. What do we got? We got... Master Puppets. Master Puppets. We got one of the solos in Orion. Um, to Live Is To Die. To Live Is To Die. Nothing Else Matters. Nothing Else Matters. A uh, little bit uh, of the solo in Outlaw Torn. He does the Tom Box uh, solo on, in House of Jack Bill. Uh, what's the one on Death Magnetic? Um, uh, Suicide and Redemption. Suicide and Redemption. Because he doesn't need it for his ego. Is this your least favorite song? No. no. A Wolf and Man? I don't know. Hell no, dude. I love A Wolf and Man. Often in the Days Missed I Ride? It's going to bum you out. That's a justice riff. That's kind of that. You know, that's kind of like that's kind of like short of straw. Yeah, it is like short of straw. That E F uh, B flat A. But you sitting again? Yeah. You back down. I just had to take a break. I'm on a drum stool, and it was two hour mark. Come sit over here if you want. No, it's good. Do you want to switch seats? No, I want to be on camera. Oh wow. Okay. <laughs> Therefore I am harvest the lamb. Take a was made for loving you, baby. <laughs> so much kiss, dude. He does a 16 note for a second there. I've never known the 16th note till tonight. The Enter Sandman one, or I'm sorry, the Wherever I'm in Rome one is, is the best. Watch the Wherever I'm in Rome video and you, and you can see him do it. Really? Yeah. When this record first came out, I thought it was shame, 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 yeah. shame. I was I was so excited about this record, I didn't even bother to look at the lyrics. I was just listening. Were to it you like, projecting? Oh my God. Were you projecting your own shame? Oh yeah, I was very ashamed of myself onto the project. Yeah. yeah. This does have kind of the more traditional two rhythms here and the yeah. thickener down the center. Right. Yeah. By the way, I'm having a great time, guys. Good, me this is too. so much fun. I'm so stoked to be here, man. Can we listen to three more records tonight? As long as I sleep here, yes. <laughs> How about you just don't delete this one? Wow. Ooh, burn. <laughs> the Paul burn. Sick burn, bro. You know, I'll say this. The one we did was great. This is this is above that. This needed to happen, the three of us. It was meant to be, dude. Life. Got any wolves out there? <laughs> oh! <laughs> Good solo. So good, dude. Just chaotic and awesome. It kind of goes downhill a little bit, though. Uh, that's pretty good. I like that. Got any wolves out there? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Jason <laughs> Brantley. Asking Call about the me. wolf out there. Call me by. Brantley, it's Jason. 
Then you got some wolves on my property. Need your help, buddy. Call me back. Bye. Brantley, Jason, Little Riding Hood called. She didn't like all this wolf talk. Now be a buddy and call me back. Bye. Brantley, it's Jason. Uh, that big bad wolf them uh, blow my house down. Need to help rebuilding it. Call me back. Bye. <laughs> I like this stuff here. Uh, I don't like the Jason Brantley bit because I'm just sitting here going, I have nothing to contribute. You contributed earlier to it. You did some Jason Brantley. Or on S and M. Oh, that's as clean, baby. baby. Can you believe how good this song is and it's just buried on this record? I know. Yeah. And we haven't even done My Friend of Misery or Dude, God That Failed the yet. Deep, the deep cuts on this record are still amazing. Yeah. It's funny because I'm like, they should have played this the other night. The, uh, Wolf and Man was in one of the rotating oh. slots in, in Europe. Get ready Dude. to bob your fucking heads. Check it, Is This is where he did over to the shotgun. Check it. Check it. Man. Did you, no, you, have, you need more than I did. Paul's refilling it. What happened? We're about to kill this bottle of black and whiskey. It's almost done. Oh. Oh! That's what we're doing. That's what we're, we're passing it that way. That's what we're doing. Da, da, da. I'm still curious what your least favorite song is, because you said before... I, can't, I honestly can't believe you don't know what it is. Is it Inner Sandman? Hell no. Is it this? Hell Struggle no. Struggle with it. <laughs> it. It really... I have no connection to it. Well, you it's might, like, it you, may as well be Metal Militia to me. Really? You might tonight. When you do it, when this you get is done, kind of another Sabbath truth, by that. the way. Blackened, a bold collaboration of the finest hand selected whiskey, an unrivaled composition of craft and creativity, born in cask, forged by sound. Bottled by Sweet Amber Distilling Company. <laughs> oh, there it is. Hey, what are we going to name our new distillery that we're bottling our black and whiskey? Let's pick our like least popular record. You know they call their payroll frantic. Their payroll is frantic. How do you know this? I know some people who are on their payroll. Dude, God That Failed is so fucking sick, man. I know. And you know, when people talk about some of their heaviest songs, Sab True, Things Should Not Be... Harvester of Sorrow. This is one of them. Devil's Dance. This is one that doesn't get talked about, but... Song about his mom refusing treatment, treatment for yeah. cancer. It's deep stuff. It's This is heavy material, man. How old was James when they were making Black Elf? 30. If that. I mean, this was... This is 90. Ten year, nine years after they started. I was really so. hoping you would say 50 so that I could say, okay, I still got time. So like when this when this record came out, like I'm looking at these dudes like they're in their 40s. No, probably. I know, but they were they were younger than us for sure. Yeah. Yes. They were in their I mean, I think they were 30, 32, I think, 31. I think late 20s, early 30s. I love this the, Kirk the solo. hits. The hits from this record. Sorry, we'll listen to the solo. Do people really watch the YouTube? Yeah. Hey there. That's good, dude. That's real good. That's what I'm saying. That. The hits on this record are so undeniably good. It's a shame that these songs got kind of buried. Because there's a lot of TLC oh, in the composition of these back songs. The whole band did a Lars snare and crash right there. Well, they, they and they wrote that together for sure. Yeah. Yeah, but how can that compete with? It's true. Wherever I may roam. Well, when you hold them up, it makes sense. This yeah. isn't that. My Friend of Misery is Gary, but it's not The Unforgiven. Which is why we still need albums today. Right. That, remember, we don't need 11. The gun. shotgun. Yeah. 
We don't need 11 wherever I may roam. Right. Well, you got to balance the record out. Yeah. And this subject matter might not. According to my calculations, James was 27 years old into this record. What? They recorded it in 90. Right. And he was born in uh, 1963. So 1990 minus 1963, 27. Well, he was in his late 20s doing this record. When do we, do we kill? Not our, even late 20s. Do we kill ourselves yeah. after the struggle within, or do we kill ourselves after now. the Paul Moak Q and A? By the way, we're doing a Q and A with Paul Moak yeah. after this episode. If you're still, st- if you're still with us, <laughs> oh, they're uh, with, they're with us. Yeah. Good luck with that. My favorite song on this record is coming up next. I can't wait. I do want to put a marker in the sand of that combo. Um, about that's why we need albums. Yeah. Great. Don't let me forget that because I want to talk to you about that. Yeah. Oh. Is that a new Quentin, Quentin Tarantino? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Pulp Fiction 2. <laughs> Jason? Jason Newstead's last co write. And it's a fucking barn burner. It is. I thought you were about to do a Jason Brantley bit. <laughs> I don't want to disrespect the song. Yeah. Jason. Oh, so good. Jason. <laughs> Jason Brantley. Brantley. Love the bass line. Call Listen, me back. Bye. Killer bass line. We might be able to turn it into a Metallica song. Be a buddy. Call me back. Bye. Jason, man. James is getting a little weird about your band, man. Jason another- Brantley. Oh, I'm going to keep doing the bit. Listen. Right, do the bit. James really likes that bass line. He thinks it might really be something. You know, really, he's really bummed about the sicko brain thing, though, man. Be a buddy. Call me back. Bye. <laughs> I tried to do that just then. I failed. Love that slide up. Yeah. How epic is this, man? This song is so, like, that open hat. Double time. I'm not a fan of that lyric very much. The empty can they say the, the empty can rattles the must. But do they? Does it? <laughs> you! Some good you's in this one. And then we got key change chorus. Cowbell chorus. Who is your call? Listen. My friend of It it really is a beautiful song. Like these those parts they just play right there. I agree. With Jason's bass line and the rhythm is gorgeous. I agree. You know what's weird, though? It's like this is a not produced song in terms of like the Unforgiven or something right, where yeah. it's got a bunch of overdubs or whatever. It's really just the band, but it's very produced for being a ve- uh, like the four guys yeah. track. It's yeah. tight. Yeah. I think maybe that's what weirds me out about it. Am I it. just not strong enough to tighten this? Because it just keeps... Th- those those mic stands you have to really tighten. No, them. that's a, a watch. It's just telling you what time it is. Is that how that it works? goes lower? You like? I'm just been fighting it all night. You're strong. Ethan's strong. Dude, he touches these. He does this on those, and I can't move them. You got like a good torque. Thank you. Proud of my torque. Okay, <laughs> my favorite part, possibly the entire record, is coming up. The most beautiful part of the whole record. The bee bender? This is kind of like the To Live Us To Die moment of the record. Okay. You get a little sleepy tie tie? I'm good. We're going to go to Taco Bell after this. I'm in. Then we're going to drive to Detroit. I'm in. Oh, awesome. It's kind of Metallica meets Pink Floyd. Meets the Phantom at the Park. It's the one note that goes up. Right here. No, it's coming up. Sorry. Right here. Yes. Mm, love that one. 
Meow. Be better. God damn it, that's so gorgeous. It's great. So good. And awesome. it's a theme that will repeat through the loads, dude. This is loadish. Yeah. Kind of Unforgiven like too, right? Guitar here. Harmonies yeah. here. Look at that double stop. Yeah. yeah. It's like a video game, dude. It's almost kind of lazy on the I've never bends. gotten this far, Mom! <laughs> Don't let me go to no. bed right now! I, I just gotta finish this level! That's totally what it is. Yeah, double dragon. <laughs> double dragon! <laughs> oh my god, dude, that it's, is so it's accurate. double dragon for sure. That is so fucking accurate. Like Contra. Yeah. <laughs> up, up, down, down, no, left, left, right, left, right, right, right start. select, start. Well, yeah. You don't need to hit select, actually. Yeah. Unless you want to do two player. Two player. That's classic Kurt. Who played the other one before that? I have actually heard that that was James. Is that James? Bow, da, da, da. That sounds like James to me. It's got, it's got that James stank it's on kinda... it. Little stank. Little James stank. James stank. Yeah. stank. Little head stank. Little, little head stank. <laughs> see, I say, you say that this one isn't as produced. I still think that they... It's got a sheen no, on it. No, it's produced. They still spent a lot of time. I remember seeing in the documentary, like, Lara's, like, picking out percussion and tracking the cowbell. Yeah. Well, they had the whole percussion day in, in Vancouver. Remember that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, like, Lars didn't know what a tambourine was. He was just like, what's What? Um. Um. What? Um. And this is a nice little. Some good yes. I love when they go into that last little riff that wasn't in the song at all until the very end. They saved it, man. Saving the sauce. So good, dude. That's so awesome. Dig it, dig it. Dig it. Wah wah. Look at you, man. It's a theme, man. You're like My you're like song. you're like either the Indiana Jones of the Black Album or you're like Nick Cage in National Treasure 2. I think Nick Cage. Of the Black Album. By the way, your Lee Serrett song, this intro right here could have easily been on justice. But please understand, and I know that you both know this, dear listeners out there in Metal Up Your Podcast land. Just because it's my least my my least favorite on the record, don't mean I don't right. like it. How justice is this? Are we sure this isn't blackened in forward motion? Whoa, ee, oh, whoa, whoa, ee, oh. That's exactly. It's Freight into Sanity. There you go. All right. This is the. This is one of the thrash. Oh, is Paul standing again? No, no, no. It's got a kind of cool punk rock thing. That's why you like it. You like the punk rock of it. Yep. I mean, it's not oh, one thing I don't like. I'm not trying to pin you down on it. I'm don't. sure you like many so, things about but here's it. Here's the deal. When you say least favorite song of this record, where does it rank? Is it still like a, an eight? Out of ten? Ra- no, yeah. rank it with the rest of the catalog. Oh, way low. Way low. All right, rank it with general songs of the era. I mean, this song, if they have 150 songs, this song's going to be in the last 30. Jeez. Wow. What can I say? I don't... What can There's I say? 29 songs on Lulu, so... <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't stick out to me. It doesn't... It's not memorable to me. Oh, I love this one. It feels... It feels like Metal Militia to me. If someone's going to play Metal Militia, I'm going to listen to it. I'm going to like it. Sure, of course. But, but am I ever going to like choose to listen to it? What would you it? rank this on this record as far as like, like 1 through 10? Struggle with 10. That's tough for this album, and I'm not trying to hedge what you're asking. It's a good question. It's tough for this album because this album is so fucking good, and it yeah. sounds so good. Right. And it's obviously them at peak composition. Sure. There's no fat. It's 
from a songwriting standpoint, I really appreciate it. Yeah. So, you know, I'd probably give it a 7 out of 10. All right. This and it's song, my least favorite song. This song or Shoot Me Again? Oh, Struggle Within, for sure. Struggle Within or The Unnamed Feeling? Struggle Within. Struggle Within is going to beat anything on St. Anger. Sweet Amber. Yeah. Some kind of monster. Yeah, it beats all that. Yeah, it does. Frantic? Yeah. Struggle okay, Within. Okay, good. For sure. This song Struggle Within absolutely be- destroys, my, bitch slaps anything on that record. Right, fav- let me pull up Lulu. My favorite, <laughs> it'll it'll beat everything on Lulu. My favorite definitely. song on St. Anger is Dirty Window, and this beats that. Yeah. But you know why, though? Because it's just it sounds like the Black Album. Good Kirk work here. So, so even if the song is Kirk a little... Kirk work. Kirk work. It's a nice song. Kirk work. That's classic Kirk, though, that... Yeah, that yeah, the yeah. sending. Go. go. Oh, good go. Oh, this riff. Pretty That's good. So good, good dude. Riff. Pretty good. Da-da-da, da-da. Pretty good. Please, sir, <laughs> tell me. What the hell? Do you? How do you feel about when they say "What the hell"? I love it. You don't. You don't dig it, Clint. <laughs> What if they said, what the fuck? What the fuck? I'm immediately on board. <laughs> it's the 90s, though, dude. I like, this, I like the halftime groove of the chorus. This is like a good Megadeth song. Oh, Ooh. dude. Whoa. Fighting words. Whoa. Paul had to stand up for that one. <laughs> All okay, right. there's the record. Well, we did it. I mean, we listened to the Black Album. Paul had to stand up for the end of the. Are you are you stand up for your questions? Um, because we're only two and a half hours in, we only yeah. have about fifty thousand questions for you. We don't. Oh, we have about ten, so we put it out to the patrons. One of the things you get to do. Uh, by the way, I'm glad I got to listen to that record. With that you guys. was so much fun. That's so become. awesome. I, we, I dare to say that, that was short, even though, even though it's barely over an hour. That record. Um, even though I fucked up and I deleted that last Black Album episode you and I did together, this was way more fun. Well, as long as that's true. It was way more fun for me. It's way true. <laughs> it was, well, I'm glad Paul had more fun. Now, I mentioned that sort of, maybe in the don't tread on me portion of that, we've got some questions for Paul. One of the things you get as a patron, you get to ask our guest questions. Our patrons had several for Paul, maybe 10 or 11. Are we all good for that? We all ready to rock for that? I'm missing some because I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Well, one of them has two. Eight. Okay. All right. Well, don't count. Don't call me out on the. I'm just. I'm just. I'm, I just. I want to be. Hey thorough. guys. I want to be thorough. I really need to know the number. He needs to know start. if it's eight or eleven. Uh, Paul, it's seventeen. All right. Brian Ward asks, "Who's a drummer? So he's okay. a musician." He asks, "If you had the opportunity to produce any Metallica record, which one do you think your vision could most have benefited? Justice, Saint Anger." What about engineering? Which album? Vision? Man, it would probably be Reload. Really? Really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, just because I feel like that was when the band was like, what if? And I feel like I could fulfill that role of when they're like, what if we? I'm like, yeah. What if I did a hurdy gurdy? I, I know a guy that plays a hurdy gurdy. So they make it. Load. So they, they start writing all the songs. Well, that was all kind of together right but so they get load out yeah, and then yeah. they have a whole year to do press and maybe some touring and then they come back to revisit the material and they they're like you know what load worked we want to be a little more experimental with reload you feel like you could be like the guy to be like i think so yeah because i feel like i've been in that scenario before where it's right. like one in the kitchen sink yeah which would be fun as a producer i feel like in some ways that's a really good point because in some ways maybe some of the pressure was off because they changed so much, they're like, "Well, right, we already yeah. got, we already scared everybody." Yeah, and and it was commercially successful. They're still selling out arenas, and MTV loves it. Yep, we're going back in. It's kind of like, f- let's have fun. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. And and maybe I'm saying that because it seemed like there was no fear in that era. Yeah, you know. Oh yeah, like I no agree. fear of what. I uh, totally agree, and I think even what what people would call the missteps or like the. The fat on those records, the fearlessness of it is kind of what I'm responding to. Totally. Yeah. They were just at peak confidence. Yeah. Oh, they, they, were, they, they were willing to try whatever at that point. Yeah, they're just willing to... Yeah, they didn't the, care of the consequences. They, they had worked so hard to grow the, the machine so big that they could kind of... They had the the money in the bank mm-hmm. 
proverbially to yeah. take the risk. Right. Which I think maybe that's why I'm answering that question as a producer to come in and, and have a band that's like, we want to do this and we don't care at all. That would be super fun for me. Whereas like the pressure that was attached to the Black Album, I hope that I could arise to that occasion. Where this really needs you know. to strike hit but it, every it doesn't level. seem yeah. as fun to me as right as a record like reload yeah that's a pretty good point all right you want to read the next one yeah nick garcia says who's more difficult to work with clint or ethan <laughs> good question <laughs> well i'm not working with either of you two but we have no, worked, you have, we have worked though. with both of us oh like in a studio setting yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in general um, who's more difficult to work with be cool be Come be on. honest be fair be uh, balanced i mean i feel like my my duty to the community is to tell the truth. Tell the truth. And from my experiences working in the studio with both of these guys, uh, he's gonna say you. I think he's gonna say you. No, <laughs> for sure you. That the the word difficult just does not compute. Oh, there it is. I Dro- did show up in a fucking. Truth I did show bomb. up to do a session once, and I didn't have any guitar picks, and they were like, "How are you coming here?" <laughs> To do a guitar session. I don't session remember that, dude. With no guitar pick. No, look here. Here's what the listeners at home need to 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 know: is day in and day out, what I usually deal with is a lot of um, a lot of personal insecurity of musicians coming in. Like who? Any anybody? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Every every I don't. There's not a musician on this planet that isn't insecure, and so a lot of my job Good is for making. Them. Making sure that people feel like you're here because you're wanted. You're here because you deserve to be here. That's right. You're good enough. Instilling confidence. Enough. I feel like my job with you two guys has been pretty easy. You come in and you know what you're supposed to do. They're... I did do the stand down solo in one Cheer- take. Cheers to that. Yeah. Hey, here's what, here's what, here was a pretty good feeling. That day, came in. My job was just to play the one solo. You had both dialed up some sort of wet ambient Johnny Greenwood radio yeah. head sound that you know I like. And we you said, Do you wanna I think you said do you even want to know the chords or something? And I was like, No, let's I think just all, do it. I think all I told you was the key of the song. I'm like, it's in it's in G minor. So I did kind of this cool anti solo, very understated thing. It's awesome. And I remember looking like around because I I know I thought it was cool, but when you both guys were both, especially you, I'm talking to Paul, the producer, was like, That was it. I'm like yeah. Woo! That felt pretty good. There you go. Yeah, it was. And not, awesome. It wasn't some barn burner Eddie Van Halen thing, but to just hit the right notes that made the record in that one moment. Side note: If you would have done a Eddie Van Halen solo on my reggae record, I would have been you thor- thoroughly you might have, impressed. You might have kept that too. Well, you know might what the, the Nashville producer answer for a, a really great take is? What they go, they go? That was perfect. Let's do it again. Okay, one more. <laughs> yeah, totally. Let's just do. Let's just do one more for safety. Yeah. Oh, I love when I'm producing a vocal in my studio. They're like, "Can I? Let's just do one more." I'm like, "We're probably going to do more." I mean, we're probably going to do, do about ten. Let's more. do another one. Let's be honest. That's why when whenever I'm cutting background vocals, I always go ten more. T- yeah, every time. Yeah, it never gets lower. Yeah, ten more. All right, Jason Barry asks, "What are some of your favorite albums that you've produced?" Oh man. Well, hey, come on, Ethan Love. Come on, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, it it really was a blast, man. I we feel had like a good time. You allowed me to to reach into parts of my musical catalog that I haven't gotten to in the oh. reggae world. And Hell well, yeah. let me say this to you both because I haven't been able to address you both about this. Just as a a friend and fan, I got to play on one song. You guys knocked that record out of the park. It's so fucking good. And what I loved about you is we were doing some metal up your podcast episodes at what we lovingly call HQ Four, right? Which is the smokestack. And there was all this like reggae shit in the record room. Oh yeah, yeah. And you, I remember Ethan was like, "Yeah, Paul's like researching. You know, we're gonna make a reggae record, so he's been buying these reggae records." Well, no, I brought all those in. You brought them in, but you yeah. were like listening and you bought I instruments. Bought a couple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You bought like t- what'd you get? Timpanis or what did you buy? Timbali, uh, Timbalis. Which, by the way, that uh, got me in trouble with the wife, but it's yeah. cool. They were famously played on the song "Smooth." Rob I, Thomas. Yeah, they they belong to uh, what's his band? Matchbox, 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 20. Matchbox Twenty. You know Matchbox Twenty. No, and that I, that I was just re- had a mental fart. That was relevant yeah. today when me and my wife were leaving the store today. That we had just had the radio on. That song came on. And I go, hey babe. She, I'm like, you know this song? She's like, yeah, I hate this song. 
I'm like, that's irrelevant. The timbales on the song are the same timbales they used yeah. on my record. So, only in Nashville, there's a music store down the street that is a used music store, and they had bought... Was it Corner? No, it was Tom Bukovac's place. Oh. Second year. Second year. Yeah. They had bought all of... Uh, what is the band? Match Match 20. 20. Like, a, I can't like, a, like a storage unit or something? Yeah, yeah. They bought yeah. their locker. Yeah, their locker. That, and that so happens we, a lot here. We picked it up and used it on his record. Amazing. It was awesome. Do you guys remember when I was in a band called Duga? We were signed yeah. to Zach Brown's yeah, yeah. label. So Matt Serletic, who produced and wrote that, was our manager. Wow. Crazy. He, was also, he also played Keys and Collective Soul. So me as a 90s kid, I geeked out on him a lot. Wait. Played Keys and Collective Soul. Yes. Yeah. Managed your band. Yeah. Signed Matchbox 20? Wrote and produced Smooth and managed Matchbox with Rob Thomas's manager. And remember Rob Thomas did a solo career? What was that big song he had in his solo career? Smooth. Smooth. No, no, no. <laughs> not not the Santana. It was it was different from that. Um anyway, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Welcome to the Rob Thomas podcast. All right, wait, wait, wait. I want to answer your question for real. Cause because oh. these people they want to know. Oh, I thought, I thought it was just my record. Yeah. Continue. So Ethan your favorite Lutt. records, other than Let It Burn, of course. You guys at home, if you're listening. They are. Check out a band called Love Drug, uh, a record called Wild Blood. Love Drug is great. I've heard Love Drug. Awesome. That record great. is awesome. There's a band called Leagues. Um, that Cockerel. Yeah, what is the name of that Tyler record? Burkham. Uh, Tyler Burkham, who's one of the most underrated guitar players I've ever Tyler Burkham, amazing. Pretty over. Uh, he plays for Carney still. You Belong Here is the name of the record. Okay. Um, is that Jeremy Letito? Uh-huh. Jeremy Letito, Thad Cockrell, Tyler Burkham. Power Trio. For those of yeah. you who don't know those names, it's kind of a dream team in Nashville. Yeah. yeah. Tyler lived here for a long time, uh, moved back to Minnesota where he's from. I think he's back here now, though. Is he back here? No, no, no. He's, no? he's still okay. in Minnesota. Um, at one point, when I, first, when I first moved to Nashville, Tyler and his wife, Allie, didn't move too far from me and my roommates. And Tyler and I, when we both weren't on the road, would just like explore guitar shops explore around town. Explore your sexuality. Yeah. And our sexuality. <laughs> um, but yeah, we had like, Tyler's such an amazing dude, incredible guitar player. You're, you're awesome. right though, very, very, very underrated. That band, uh, a band called The Weeks, that was, mm-hmm. they were signed by your old employer, Kings it's of Leon. It's a shame, it's a shame. The Weeks is one of my wife's favorite bands. Okay. Uh, Dear Bo Jackson is the name of the record. Yeah, she loves that. Um, and then a fourth one would be a band called the Lonely Biscuits. Okay, uh, they're self-titled. I gotta band. say, a uh, Banquet for Ghosts is up there for me. Absolutely, we uh, should Matthew, talk about Matthew, Matthew Mayfield. Mayfield. Yeah, he made a record. It was mostly just you and him, right? Totally, except strings and it's it's a very uh, dark record, which a lot a lot of Matthew's records are dark. Yeah, but. This one has this kind of grace to it, and it's before I came on board with Matthew. It has nothing to do with me, and yeah. I think I started working with him touring that record. So I was learning Track You Down and Take What I Can Get and Always, all these beautiful songs. I was like, God damn. It's called A Banquet for Ghosts. It's a great yeah. record. That's great a great record. one. It is an amazing record. He's an amazing artist. He's probably, of all the people I've ever worked with, probably we're the most kindred spirits. Yeah. And... I think had the the best ride in terms of of just living life together over yeah almost a decade. Yeah, I will say this: uh, when we were making that record, he had one song that was like a little piece of a song. It was like thirty seconds, and we couldn't figure out what to do with it because it was going to be like a little segue song. So we were at the studio late one night, and we had not been drinking water. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so Powerade or Gatorade. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We, did, we decided my studio backs up to a cemetery and we decided it would be awesome if we recorded this in one microphone in the middle of the cemetery. Dude, we could get like a ghost to sing harmonies. Oh, yeah. That would be fucking sick. You won't even hear it. Maybe uh, Satan will the show record's play. called Banquet for Ghosts. Yeah. So uh, I took like 13 microphone cables and plug them all up together to get enough link to get back there. <laughs> you don't lose any sound fidelity yeah. doing that, by the way. <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> and it's two o'clock in the morning by this point. Uh, we drag a chair out there. I get him all set up. We had called the, the girl that was like videographing the whole thing and she came out. She got set up. Courtney? 
Uh huh. Yeah. And I had just gotten this this new to me. It was a very old Neumann microphone, which is very expensive. I'd spent more money on this microphone than anything at the U eighty seven point. It was a U forty seven. Yeah, those are like seventy five yeah. ninety nine. They're yeah. pretty expensive. <laughs> And I go set it up. I run back to the studio. I get the sound. And I mean, I'm talking it's a, literally like a quarter mile away. And <laughs> I run back out there. We get everything. He gets the take. It's all amazing. It's going to be on the record. It's beautiful. She gets the footage she needs. It's awesome. And we're like, yeah, we're like high fiving. And <laughs> Matthew knocks over the microphone. And it literally goes into somebody's grave, like into the dirt. <laughs> okay. And I pull so now the, your grave diggers. I pull the microphone out, and it's got like clogs of dirt and stuck bone. To it. Yeah, yeah. And it's sinew. like all bent in and stuff. And I was very mortified at that point, but it ended up being okay. And the the song is amazing, and it's on the record. That's a good story. Go. Banquet for ghosts. There yeah. you go. There it is. I right, moved on. Question four. Moving real quickly. Yeah. Uh, Phantom Lord 3 says, uh, where'd you get that leather jacket you're rocking at the party? Uh, the leather... Oh. Uh, it's called a Langlitz. They're Langlitz. The, yeah, Langlitz. It's, if you're in motorcycle culture, they're the, kind of known as... And like, we are. They're the motorcycle jacket. They're in Portland, Oregon. Okay. And they started making that jacket in like the 40s or 50s. Oh, wow. They pricey? Uh, they're pretty expensive. Uh, that was a gift. From but a good, but what I've learned is a good leather jacket will literally last you like your whole life. thirty years. It's absolutely so they may be five hundred bucks, but right, it'll last you a long time. You know Johnny Depp and Crybaby? Oh yeah. yeah, he's wearing a Langlitz. Okay, that's the <laughs> okay. That's there the it thing. is. All right, Chris Nay says question about being a producer. Which kind of producer are you? Hands on and involved in helping shape the band's songs, or Laid back and just helping the band realize exclusively their vision. Oh man! Pretty good question by Chris. Very, very good question. Probably different from artist to artist, I'd imagine. Or do you have sort of a general approach? Um, I think I'm definitely more laid back. I'm probably. I it, agree. I'm probably left to the second. Um, when you came in to do "Let It Burn," because I know a little bit about the writing process because I was invited to be a part of it, and then it never happened. <laughs> Oh, my God. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We're not going to get derailed there. Next record. You went in and had a lot of fleshed out demos. Yes. Very so, much so. And I remember one of the things you were telling me is like it, you were sort of honored that Paul didn't want you to change a lot, which says a lot. I, that made me feel good as a songwriter that like there, was, there wasn't any major parts. Where he was like, man, I don't know about this. Let's, let's, let's kind of go back to the ground floor and rethink this. It made me feel good that I I did my job. I did my homework. I I did the hard work yeah. leading into that. But I that, guess the question know. is, had I guess what if Paul had said, "Well, I think the song I think this song needs a bridge, and that song needs to be shorter, and I think we need to rethink the melody." I would have listened to him and said, "Okay, let's do it. Let's work on it." But that's not your style. It's really not, man. And I think that uh, it's interesting you're asking me this because it's definitely. It, it pushes on some things that I question in myself. Yeah? Like, but, should you be more? Yeah. I mean, I think that sometimes. And then I look at those guys that are more, and I'm like, no, nah, dude, get over yourself. Yeah, I kind of agree. I, should you be more Bob Rock going like a... Yours goes... What if ours goes... See, that's the producer. Yeah, no, I man that I we don't have to spend a whole lot of time on it, but I do think a lot about that. I think I'm old enough now to realize I'm only going to be bringing out the best in what you're already bringing to the situation. So I'm not going to rewrite your song. I'm not going to. In my ex- make you something that you're not. I agree. And in my experience, cool. for me, it's more as a songwriter when I'm writing with an artist. It's like, if I'm pushing my agenda too much, it might end up something that I think is better. But if they don't yeah. feel like they own it, they're not going to take it into their world and put it on a record or right. sing it or want to play it live. It's more important for me to let them feel like they have the ownership of it. You know what's funny is I've been in the room when that happens yeah. with other people. Like when 
I've been in three way co writes where it's a bigger Ooh. three way writer. Do tell. Yeah. Like a big shot writer that has some number yeah, yeah. ones and they're kind of exerting their will. And I watch them exert their will, but make it think make the artist think that it's their their idea. Prerogative. Yeah. yeah. And it blows my mind. Yeah. Dude. It's kind of a weird cunning. Yeah. It's a whole different talent. It is weird. And I think what I've realized at this point is there's some artists that need that. They need someone speaking to their life and saying, this is what you need to do. Yeah. And I'm just not that guy, yeah. you know? And so for me, like an artist like Matthew Mayfield, it that's why we get together and we gel so much is he knows what he wants. He just needs help getting there. And so... But I've also seen him be real amenable to... I remember when we were making a blue cut record, um, we were kind of putting those songs on a, on a, under a microscope and saying, we should cut this chorus and we should intro this. And he would, I remember being really impressed with him, like him being really open to that. Yeah. Like whatever you guys think we should do, yeah. whatever you think is going to make it better, let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's pretty cool. And that's my experience with Paul uh, working on an EP and a full length, uh, just one on one is Paul will take what you have brought to the table and just make it better in all sorts of ways, whether it's just like adding different instruments to it, completely rewriting it, re- rewriting it. Um, no, but it, like he, like for me, he, all my songs, he he took what I brought in and exceeded my expectations, even if it means it's just a little thing. Well, I added this organ part to it and this mellotron part yeah. to Let it. Let me ask you guys this, since you're both here, and this wasn't one of these questions. What was it like for you guys working together? Being, I know you guys have a long friendship, True. you have a lot of mutual respect going into a producer artist situation was that a strain on your friendship or did your friendship help? I don't think so at all mm. no. what I mean to, to, was your friendship yeah different? I, I don't think so either Ethan uh, yeah me too <laughs> no I mean I, I would say honestly for me you know like some of the lyrical content on my record let it burn is some of the heavier stuff I've ever written and that's it's, why it's so good by the well, way it, thank you and it takes like working with someone like Paul uh, especially being a good friend of mine, I'm not afraid to explain these things to him. Right. Um, you know, it, it, it's like sitting down like, you know, with a buddy and at your house or whatever, you're going through something kind of heavy and you want to talk to somebody about it. That's what it felt like working with Paul with these songs for me. Did so, you guys ever disagree? Yeah. Oh yeah. And not, not, but I mean, not, not, nothing like major where it was like, Oh fuck man, I can't believe it doesn't like that. Whatever. Like it, it was all stuff that was it was easily compromised. It was like, hey, I'd say uh, change this just a, a touch. I think it'll work better. And I, I have an ex- enough experience to know that I'm not going to fight that. I'm going to say, okay, let's try it, sure, or vice versa. I might yeah. Paul might be like, hey, here's this idea. I'm like, uh, I, I'd rather try this. I think what it comes down to when you're when you when it really gets down to the essence of things in the studio is trust. And, right. Yep. Uh, both ways, right? Right, absolutely. Oh, yeah, for sure. And so for me and Ethan, it was like, I'm trusting that he he is the artist that he says he is, that he's written the songs that he has, and that he's coming in knowing what he wants. And he's trusting me with his vision of that. Right. And what happens is when you add millions of dollars to that, when you add... <laughs> which I did. <laughs> which, which, of course, happened. When you add... Uh, uh, radio and chart positions and right. a label and Which all I of that. It's <laughs> it. I, honestly, it's our relationship is really no different than Metallica and Bob Rock, other than all these outside influences that that come up. And I know because I've been in those situations where if if it was just left to me and the band, we'd probably have the the same relationship that me and Ethan do, but. You got a literally a ton of pressure added to the fire because of all the things around you. You got deadlines. You got they, they don't think songs are where they need to be. They're hoping a certain song can do a certain thing for them commercially, and they yeah. don't hear it yet. Yeah, you, you get, you'd like to think that every artist walks into the studio with a producer and says, "Let's be as creative as we can be and make right. what we love." Right. Well, in, but in it's our not case, the reality. In our case, that that's what worked though, because there wasn't any pressure like that. That's what I'm. I saying. don't have a label. I don't have management. I don't have a booking agent. It's all DIY. It's all yeah. DIY. Yeah. I mean, I funded this whole thing through Kickstarter and my own pocket, and so that that pressure was off the table for exactly. you and I, and it was great. 
but I do love that you basically said that you and I created the the black album of reggae. So thank you, Paul. Well, I mean, without belaboring the point, it, I mean, it really is an amazing record. Well, thank you. I feel like I'm moderating like a TED talk now, yeah. but keep going, please. All right, I'm uh, just waiting. I'm just waiting for Clint to make his record with Paul because then I can guest on man. it. Well, I think I think it needs to be Lunar Satan if it's anything. Do that, sure. Because here's what you here's what normally an artist will do if they like say I hired Paul. I'm like I have whatever I have a budget that makes sense for Paul, and I'm going to make a a ten song record. Here's what you don't want to do because I have a huge body of songs. I'm like here. I'm going to send you a Dropbox link that's eight terabytes of six hundred songs. <laughs> Please pick the ten you think are great. So you I have think, no idea. I th- I know that I know that happens. I know that cra- I, crazy I shit happens. Literally say this all the time. I make my take home commission on a record before we even record the first note because of the pre production. Because of how much I have to listen yeah. and make comments on yeah. and whittle songs down. Literally, my work is done before we even get in the studio. <laughs> right. And then I, I got to actually produce a record. Here's the good news for you. Lunar Satan, I only have three songs. There you go. I only have three songs. I brought and in we're a, only cutting one. I, so I, was, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I brought in 11. We recorded 11. There you go. All right. Chris Nace had a follow-up question, a little less serious question about the dreads. And he says, be honest. Yeah. Which Paul's not prone to do, obviously. Yeah. true. Yeah. He says, do you ever have days, hours, moments where you wish you could just cut your hair off and start anew? Specifically in the summer, I find my long hair to be unbearable at times. Yeah. It's not really related to heat. It's more... Uh, Is it weight? No, Is it, it girth? It's, it's... Okay. It's definitely girth. Let's get into it. <laughs> it's definitely girth. So, I have a time once a night where one of my kids will wake up and want to get in bed with us or... My dog barks at somebody running down the street or whatever. Ethan, he's streaking. Yep. Now, That's I wake out. up, and I realize that my dreads are wrapped around my neck, and they're choking me. It's <laughs> like a great horror movie yeah. premise. And I have to like literally untangle myself or I'm going to die. We could call the movie Dreadful <laughs> or Dreaded. Okay, so that's one. Two, I guess when... I have been in like the Home Depot parking lot at 2 p.m. on a July. Are you 16th. in a band? Yeah. You get that look. Oh yeah. No, where where it's like literally there. I'm I'm gonna overheat because it's so hot. L- let's understand this for some context. What's the commitment here? How long has this taken? The dreads. Yeah, like you, you've uh, got full on like probably down to your lower back, maybe to your butt even. Yeah, dreads. past. What's the what's the time commitment? I started them when I was 23 and I'm 39. Wow. So it's no it's joke. Commitment, yeah. Yeah, they honestly if I hadn't cut them by now, they'd be down to my ankles. So when you get frustrated, do you think about I've committed so much to this. Though I'm frustrated, I'm going to stay the path. No. I will say this to answer his question. Keep him. I've literally never since I was 23 and I started these never thought I need to cut these now. <laughs> Literally never once. Even when you've been bombed and inconvenienced by Yeah, them. I've been inconvenienced. I've been choked in the middle of the night. <laughs> Dreaded. But I cannot imagine you without anything yeah. else in your I kind of can't either. The only time I think I about it. I don't want it. I don't want it to happen ever. Okay. The it's only a, time I think about it don't is do when, it for Ethan. when the high and tight came popular. High and tight. Okay. Man like bun? five years ago? No, no, no. Just high and tight. No. High and tight. The high and tight. Like, I'm sorry, literally I'm... like 1950s Grease. Yeah, it's look. kind of... Kind of oh, it's like alm- almost, Zac Efron? Almost a pompadour, but like not really. Grease. Yeah, Grease. Okay, yeah. John okay. Travolta. I'm yeah. familiar. When the Grease thing became popular, I was like, oh, I could rock that. Get a letter jacket. Put the... Put the... Yeah, you could do yeah, that. It's a collar. You, know? you kind of mocked collar. it up for me now, and I can see it. Yeah. With the popped collar on the leather. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I, can I was see like, it. I could do that. And I got. You're doing Crybaby 2 and crying into a, totally. cup, a glass of water. Totally. But here's the thing that, that's like, you, I, I don't deny you wouldn't look, look, look good with that. You would look awesome. <laughs> but. What a sentence. I, no, I don't deny that. You would look good like that. I don't not do not want to deny that, that I can't not <laughs> deny that. No, but. Um, I don't think you're the kind of guy that goes along with trends. Totally. And, Which is why I didn't do it, though. And I appreciate that. Yeah. And I think you should keep the dreads forever. 
I probably I can will. tell you like with confidence that the dreadlock look will not become popular in Nashville anytime soon. I will say this. And it's oh, it's a, it's a Paul Moak thing here. There was a time and I I think you guys might have referenced this on the show. There was a time this summer where I went to the beach with my family and I shaved the sides of my head and I pulled the hair back and I took a picture. Someone said they thought you cut them off. Yeah. Was it Blazik? Uh, I can't remember who it might have been Blazik. Someone texted I think it a, was Brad. Someone texted us and said yeah. Oh, Paul cut all his hair off, and we were, I was like, "There's yeah. no way." I don't think so, he did, dude. He I didn't called think, us first. I I didn't. <laughs> he would have called us first. <laughs> hey guys, just want to let but, you know. Just so you know, before you see it on Instagram, just so you're not scared. So here's the thing: the, the post was like very. I'm at a point in my life where you <laughs> you're, know, because you're kind of a poet and a philosopher sometimes on the internet. Maybe, yeah, you are. I didn't realize what I was selling to people. It was a haircut. <laughs> yeah. And and I literally had people that when my kids were born didn't reach out to me that were like, dude, what did you do to your hair? Yeah, it's more important than the birth yeah. of your children. Yeah. So I messed up there. I still have people coming to me. I thought you cut your dreads, man. All right. So we have one anecdote that I'll read and then Ethan will read our last question. Right. So the anecdote, which I've already mentioned in the episode, is from our friend Anya. She says, I don't really have a question. I just like to say that Paul has the absolute best accent. Paul, love listening to it, so please talk a lot. Oh, man. That actually means a lot because I always feel like when I go home from these things, like you guys are real succinct and have all your thoughts together, and I'm just like, uh. Well, that's true. She's talking specifically about your accent. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Listen, uh, if, if you didn't have insightful things to say and a, a beautiful voice, people wouldn't want you back, man. The, the the crowd loves you. Oh, wow. Here's the deal. I've gotten saltier as the podcast has grown, and you're the you're like the evanescent sweetie pie. <laughs> yes, and you also have a sweetie pie vibe, well, but cool. you kind of also have a business vibe too. Like a like a I'm going to tell you what's going on. Yeah. So I yeah. think that you right. continue to neutralize. I'm making this all about me, actually. I think people are <laughs> hating me the more we go. That's not true. And you bring them more of a, a nice thing. Well, right. who said that? Anya. Anya. She's, Anya. From, she's from London. She's she's cool. Or England. Thank you. England? I said London. I oh. said or England. I can't remember if she was from specifically London, but she's 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 British. We have yeah. had an entire bottle of black and whiskey. Yeah. Here's our last question. It's not it's it, he's not kidding. For one it's, Mr. Paul it's Milk. Uh this is from Lou Delia. Have you ever had a band come in to record and you didn't like the music or the guys themselves? Uh, have you ever ended a project during the recording because the album was uh, Ooh. before the album was finished? You ever had you ever stopped a project because you didn't like what was going on? One hundred percent. Wow, it was Creed. Called, it called Reliant. K. It was Human Clay. But here, here's the thing. <laughs> I would love to say that I'm built on principle, but it's not that. I, I I will literally go to the to the ends of the earth, but I have been pushed past the ends of the earth before wow. to have to. To give up on projects because of the band or because of business stuff around um, it, both. I mean, the money been, got weird, or the, the drugs got weird, or everything. Someone I've, got. I've had a project. Uh, I had a band break up because it was a husband and wife duo in the band, and they split while we were making the record. Wow, that was not fun. That was Let It Burn, by the way. That was Human Clay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I had a band get dropped while we were making a record. And then so the funds dry up, so there's just yeah. no more money. Yeah. I, have you ever, you ever been in the van on an eight in the middle of an eight week tour? Oh yeah. And then you find out the label folded, dude. And you're like, well, not only what are we going to do for the rest of the two months? Am I getting paid? Yeah. Yeah. For the time I've been out here, it's real, man. It's, it's very you've real. You had that happen to you too. Yeah. You too. Uh, I've never been on tour in the, in in the middle of it. Well. I take like that the back. tour support completely evaporated while you're yeah. out. Not that specific, but I, I have done a tour where like I was reserving a rental car to drive home because they weren't going to pay me. Oh, you? Oh, I know, I know about that. Yeah, yeah, yep. that was gnarly. Uh, so how do you navigate coming in on Monday or Tuesday or whatever day it is, and you're saying we can't move forward on the record? Well, I mean that kind of stuff is easy in terms of what like what you're talking about when it's outside involvement because. Then you you can pin it up to like look right. man in business yeah the label dropped you I can't deal with this. what about interpersonal it's, it's harder when like I had a band one time um, <laughs> every band Creed. that he can't say is Creed it's no. Creed yeah no I've I've literally 
uh, man, it feels it's been ten years, and it's still weird saying this. You're only talking to literally uh, tens of thousands yeah, of people forever. Yeah. I've I've had my assistant look out the front door while the band was at lunch, and I was replaying parts just to make sure that the band didn't kick a member out that couldn't cut it because I want to keep the. Oh wow, that's really good of you. That's a producer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's it, part of the it job. It sucks that you have to do that and you have to kind of hide something yeah. like that. But have you ever kept a band from firing a member because you. They, I, the they, instance I was just talking about, 100%. They thought the guy had to go and you were like, look. He's he's good. He's a good yeah. player. He can do just it. Li- just listen to these parts that he plays. Just li- look. Let Clint play the solo and stand swear down. I he played this. Clint can do the solo to stand down. We'll even credit him twice on the record. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, imagine if, if, imagine if a guy like Lars. Hadn't had the business acumen and the uh, the drive to like be he the would have been face fired. of Metallica. He would have been fired if he was just being dr- like just being judged by drums. He'd have been fired. He'd been fired at least in the standards that we for and, sure. And right. I I think that he's a fantastic drummer. I think he's one of the best drummers. I think he's a living legend drummer. But yes, he but will go right. down as having one of the top ten personalities in drumming in terms of what he brings to a song. Mm-hmm. But if you're if you're solely judging him by what he can do in the studio, I agree. Well, and and him he makes the sound of Metallica. It's like Ringo. Yeah, you know the Ringo. They wanted to fire Ringo. Yeah. Yep. And you know whatever. Yeah. So anyway, so you had. That I think scenario. Ringo and Lars are two of the best drummers Agreed. ever in the history of drumming. Agreed. But I also think they're two of the the worst session drummers in terms of studio drumming does that make sense i think it's unless they're doing the thing that they've tailored their craft to right like lars can't come in and do what uh nick buddha can do right or whoever in this town evan hutchings now or whoever um but for metallica he's the dude right even if someone like carter buford came in and nailed the machine gun part to one maybe he does it tighter than lars has done since 1989 yeah it's still not going to really sound like metallica Agreed. He, he, he's meant. He's meant for that band. He's meant for those songs. Absolutely. Well, there you go, Paul Moak. I mean, there he is. You heard him. You heard it here first. It's oh, always, how about the Black Album? That was uh, fucking fun, by the way, guys. I, I, I got to say, such a treat. I, I mentioned it before, but I'm kind of glad that the other one went away into the atmosphere of deletion. That was a good one too, though. It was a really good one, but this one was better. It really was. You have to take our word for it, or at least take my word for it. It really was. It was fun. I, Paul I, Moak had to be here. I agree. It's Paul Moak's favorite Metallica record. We had our Metalla week. We're fresh off of that. We got to have a lot of cool conversation about production and Absolutely. music. And it and was a treat. Paul was also our, our first co host to stand up multiple times during the recording of this episode. I'm sorry, man. I'm just There was even some singing and shouting. I loved yeah. it. Oh yeah. Look, you were you were fronting a band at one point. So Paul, where can people let's say someone listening has a great band in Fargo. And they're like, you know what? Let's go take a shot. Where can they find you? Where could they possibly talk to you about making a record? Uh, the best way to get in touch with me is my website. Metalupyourpodcast.com. Yeah. That's right. Just email Clint and Ethan. Uh, we'll forward you, forward you Paul's uh, home phone number. Now, if you want to petition Paul to be a permanent guest host on year three, <laughs> you can send us an email at metalupyourpodcastshow at gmail.com. Put Paul Moak in the subject. Hey, well, if enough people... Want to do it? You got to figure all this stuff out with us every week. Wife, two kids, uh, busy, busy career. Yeah. I'm no totally more busy than out. you guys. Well, I just want to feel wanted. That's true. You're he just all, needs you, to hear it. You're always wanted and welcome here, Paul. Come on. Now you can go. So what's your website, by the way? Oh, I thought you already said it. PaulMuckMusic.com. You said MetalUpYourPodcast.com. Paul Muck Music joke. or MetalUpYourPodcast.com. PaulMuckMusic.com. Check out what he's doing over there. We'll put all the links in the socials. The last thing he did, which we love so much, is Ethan's record, Let It Burn. the What I'm calling the gateway drug reggae record. Okay. Like, People may have an idea of I reggae, like but then they're going to hear your record, and it's like, by the way, my four-year-old can't get enough of it. I she knows it. all I the it. words. Success. We did it, buddy. Really? I mean, I'm serious. And then guys yeah. like me, I'm like, ah, like I got a few Bob Molly records, whatever. Yeah. That record was a staple. It is a staple. Well, thank you. That means a lot. 
We got Gun Shy by Matthew Mayfield coming out March 1st. That's exciting. We all are a part of that. Obviously, yeah, Paul Moore on that one. Yeah. Uh, go leave us the review on iTunes. Go check out the Patreon. Oh, my God. At the end, do we have to say all this again? We don't. We the got Twitter. St- the the th- All the stuff. You know what we should do? We should say peace. Adios. See ya. I don't know what I used to say. <laughs> you used to say a, hor- a horrible bye. Y- you would go no no, no 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 no. It was it was peace. Adios. Thanks. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. No, it was thank you. <laughs> thank. Let's thank, do that. I like to play. Right. Thank you. Peace. Adios. Thank you. <laughs> Done. That was it. <laughs> if you were our advisor, what would you say? Then I would say delete that. <laughs>